Okay, welcome back, listeners, to another episode of the Peripheral Views Podcast. Uh, whoa, we've got a big one, a uh, big, big, big episode today. Um, Peripheral Views, this is going to be our eighth episode. Errol, uh, I'm your co-host, Jake. Errol, what's going on tonight, bud? How are we doing? Dude, I'm doing about as good as you can. I'm really excited about this. I'm ready to uh, shine a light on the Ooh. fog that That's is the lighthouse. About. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's what we're talking about tonight. Uh, we're talking about 2019 um, psychological thriller, um, horror, horror film. However, you want to categorize it. This is Robert Eager's uh, Robert. Uh, Robert I'm sorry, Robert Eager's masterpiece, in my opinion. And we'll, I mean, spoiler alert: we love the film, uh, so it'll be rated highly. But uh, we've got a lot to say about it. It's called The Lighthouse. Came out in 2019. Big film. Third. Uh, contribution to the film series for us uh that's our that's our film series in the podcast um our previous two were the pilot episode which was on the thing um you could actually draw some comparisons uh to these two films a lot of like survival uh, or survivor thematic stuff going on between the two films kind of similar in that in that vein but um um and then we kicked off our second one with the death of stalin um which was which was a good one too but we're getting into the big stuff here. Like, like I was actually just mentioning the Errol off air. This is the reason I um, wanted to do a podcast in the first place was to talk about films like this. I mean, this is, this is as good as it gets with in terms of filmmaking. And I just absolutely love a film that uh, has so many layers and so much to talk about. It's um, it's, it's just entrenched and it's open to subjectivity, which in a, in opinion discussion, which is, which is what the podcasting world is about. So we're going to dive into that. Let's do a little housekeeping before we kick things off. Uh, you know the digs, as per usual. Um, customarily, we are found at Twitter. Um, I'm sorry, on Twitter, at peripheralv123. Um, our streaming platform um, on a primary basis is soundcloud.com forward slash peripheralviews123. Contact us by e- uh, email at peripheralviewspodcast at gmail.com. Um, throw us in your old search bar at uh, on the Apple Podcast app and the Spotify app. Um, and if you do, please hit the notification bell. Be sure to subscribe, please. And if you do enjoy what you're listening to, or if you don't, either way, leave us a review and a rating uh, to get us um, just to get us a little recognition on those platforms, one way or the other, positive or negative. Um, I did want to mention uh, that the website. I actually started the construction of the website. Um, that's going to be forthcoming. I'm taking my sweet time on that, as per usual. But uh, we'll get that rolling along the way and have that pumped out and launched, hopefully, um, at some point in the next handful of weeks, maybe a month or so. Um, We really want to get that just right uh, because all of our content is going to be posted there um, henceforth. It'll still be on our platforms um, that we've been um, streaming on thus far, but it will also be a lot easier to find all of our content in one place right on the website. So uh stay tuned for that i'll keep you guys posted as we move through that process um let's talk about a little bit arrow uh, we're doing film today so i I feel a little funny about not mentioning the release of uh christopher nolan's new film oppenheimer um that dropped yesterday opening day for that film um Errol, I'm assuming that, I mean, we're both busy guys i assume that you haven't got around to seeing it quite yet what did uh is that the case for you yeah, no, I would have been there today if I thought I could squeeze it in, but I wanted to, uh, I, I legitimately wanted to watch the uh, the Lighthouse mm-hmm. again, or at least uh, go through some of the stuff. Um, interesting, uh, interesting development. I looked at a poll, and in a lot of, like, Democratic uh, states, I guess Oppenheimer's kind of, like, uh, running uh running the polls there for popularity but like in a lot of like the republican ones it's all like barbie so it's kind of weird to see that <laughs> that's like the inverse of anyone's right. expectations I really do it's like um mississippi and texas are like heavy on the barbie dude yeah i mean i'm Good. i'm 
Are they like a dumb comedy? I'm not to say that Barbie's dumb. I don't mean to say that. It might be a very good film and it's actually getting pretty good reviews. I don't know that it's, um, it is a comedy though. And like, I don't know. I assume I folks heard down south love a good comedy. Who doesn't? I, I heard it's uh, like, well, it's a satirizing Barbie too. So even if you don't like it, then that should be yeah. a good time. Yeah. And it, it, listen, I'll be honest with you. Um, so I have a, just a small um, anecdote here is that uh I actually went to the theater, just a small story. Uh, my wife and I went to the theater uh, last night to see Oppenheimer. I got tickets um, at what's, we have a movie tavern here in central New York, uh, Syracuse, New York. Um, and we have like a, a movie tavern that, you know, they serve you like, you can get your tickets in advance on, on just like everywhere else, but you can also like, they like serve you a meal at your, at your seat. And it's like a, it's a thing. It's like a niche thing. Um, I'm sure you can find them anywhere, but we have one here. And I, opted to go get tickets for it um unfortunately <laughs> this is going to be like the this, this will speak to my to the character of who i am if in a negative way here but um we actually got to the film late um by about 10 minutes or so 10 like movie started at like 5 45 i think we got there right at six and i asked the usher if like um is has it started yet and he was he assured me that uh it wasn't going to start for another like five minutes or so i was like perfect so we go to i walk into the theater and like it's like it's like right into a like the middle of a conversation in the film like the film is clearly started it's like heavy into the dialogue of Oppenheimer and I t- and it's also dark and I was like I couldn't find my seat for my wife and I and I just turned to her and I was like I'm out <laughs> I'm out like I'm, I'm leaving because I I and I explained this to her and for her she's like not quite as like a you know a cinephile as I am but she was like no, like, I think she, like, had an indication, no, let's stay and, and like, fin- finish the film. Like, let's just find our seats. Like, take a few minutes to find the seats and we'll finish it. And I, I was just, like, the thing about it is, and this is true, and, like, you don't, like, I don't know, it's a little crazy of me because it's a little unreasonable. Like, I wanted, I went and got a refund and everything, but I absolutely. Oh, I would have, and that's not an I unreasonable thing to ask for. Be like, hey, I was just a little late. I would like to come back. No, they gave me a refund. It was, and we were totally cool about it. I'm not going to, I won't, it's a uh, movie tavern by Marcus. Like great, great folks. They actually, they accommodated the refund, no questions asked. And it was like, you know, because it was only 15 minutes into the film or whatever when I got it. But I, I explained to my wife, like, she was like, why is it so important that we, it's a, like, we just missed a few minutes. It's not a big deal. I was like, it is like, if you go into a Christopher Nolan film and you miss a sentence, you are fucked. Like it will leave you in the dust. His movies. It, try to watch Inception for the first time in oh, your life. Yeah, no, like yeah. twenty minutes in, you are screwed. You won't know a thing going on. You can still enjoy the film, but I'm not like looking to enjoy Oppenheimer. Like I want. Well, I mean, I am, but like I'm looking to like study. I want to know. I want to hear every word. I want to see every shot. And by the way, like not not for nothing, but the opening sequence of every film is like a. Everybody loves. I don't know if you're a, if you're a oh, film. No, so fan, it's. It's it's exactly like even if you are like an audiophile, the right first three seconds of a song is the most important part mm-hmm. of the song. I don't care who you are. You can have the biggest buildup of all time. But if it's on the radio and it's not a good first couple, se- dude, they're going to skip. skip they lose it. They lose it. But it's not station. a it's not even for the audience either. It's like you're, I mean, you are thinking about the audience and how you want to draw them in. And like, that's like, the, it's part of the construction of the, of the art form in both senses. But like with Christopher Nolan, it's like, first of all, I know that opening sequence is probably, you know, probably dope. Like he got to just imagine like everything he's ever done. Basically at this point, the opening sequence is like, a, it's crucial probably to the plot um, on a dialogue level and B um it's probably beautiful it's probably like a gorgeous like crazy shot who knows like i don't know i actually don't know because i didn't see it but i just trust him that it's probably like it's probably breathtaking in some way and i didn't want to miss that and see the remark i just made where it's like this is a i know i've read that this is a dialogue heavy film and like i'm not itching to like miss a beat on it i want to go in and like nestle into it and really like feel like i soaked it in and not feel like i'm because you move if you're playing catch up you'll miss other stuff like things get interpreted different ways. It's you see the art in its completed form. Like, and I always, I always try to remind if I'm talking to someone who's like, not um, maybe like appreciative as I am, which is, which is reasonable. I'm a huge, you know, film buff, but like um, if you, if folks who don't appreciate film quite on that level, like I think should appreciate them more. And just to remind them, I think Louis CK made this, made a joke about this where like, um, 
people skip like the YouTube ads, right? They hit skip. And he's mm-hmm. just like, and and he's just like, uh, I think the comment in one of his bits was like, you know, somebody worked really fucking hard on that. <laughs> somebody worked really, really hard on that. Like they spent probably could, I mean, on a film, you're talking about months or years trying to get a film together. And like, even with those little short YouTube you know, ads that people skip, like it's nothing. Um, you know, people worked really, really hard on that stuff. And it, some of it's nefarious and it's trying to like, you, you might not like it because it's marketing something crappy to you, but like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it, irregardless or regardless, if you don't believe in that word, is, um, you know, that somebody worked pretty hard on it and you should see it in full. That's all. That's spoken all my like ideas a, on it. Spoken like a true shill who gets paid for ads. Goddamn right. You know what's sad is we don't have a single advertiser. We don't have any sponsorship. So I am I am literally just speaking from the uh from the heart, from the spirit. Um, it's the kind but, of service you'll get here. Is yeah, <laughs> that's right. By the way, by the way, yeah, for any for any future advertising advertising uh agencies. Um, no one here likes to skip ads. No, established. no, we watch that shit. We watch it deep and then we re- rate and review it, and then we comment on it like pieces of shit on YouTube. Yeah, so you be ready. They're like, yeah, they're like, what are you even talking about? Like, this isn't my video. But like, no, nah, the ad came up at one one minute thirty seconds. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> so um, break that down. But I'll push. I'll I'll push a little forward through that uh, anecdote about Oppenheimer. So yeah, I did not get to see the film. Um, I was pumped to see it. A little disappointed that we didn't get to. But I will say, we made the best of it. Because as we were leaving the uh, theater, I was super bummed out, and I was like, fuck, like, man, I'd really like to. You know, I'm, we're already here. My wife and I actually, and this is, this actually ties importantly to today's episode is that like, um, in, in not importantly, but in some small way, my wife and I have not been to the theater since we saw the lighthouse in 2019. Uh-huh. So we our return. This episode marks also the return of our, 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 you know, relationship to like a theater experience um and that's it's we, kind of it's really funny that you're going from like the lighthouse like a really like bright thing to like the brightest thing just like about a nuke like you're yeah, right <laughs> the, the ultimate, there's no the, other what's the next power of the sun i'm just gonna say the next movie you have to watch has got to be about like a literal star or something or well there something. is a sil- there is a cillian murphy film called by danny boyle called uh or killian murphy I, I can't i don't know how it's pronounced the, the guy who plays oppenheimer um called sunshine and i think like part of the movie like is in some kind of it's in like a super um like a science fiction film that takes it's got some kind of something to do with the sun so that would be a step up and they're still tied they're somehow all still tied together so um through killian murphy but um but to finish to close out my little story here um so yeah, we did return to the to the theater for the first time since the lighthouse. Um, but it wasn't to see Oppenheimer because of that scenario. So instead, we pivoted. Um, happened to be timing wise, it worked out great. We went and saw the fifth and final installment of Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Okay. And um, I gotta be honest with you, I'll give a short review. Um, I don't know if that's something we'll ever get around to, just because the first three films. I mean, it would take, I I would hesitate to do this film over any one of the first three. Certainly I would do it over the fourth because I think the fourth one was absolute trash. Um, Not a fan. Really disappointed in the fourth one with Shia LaBeouf, uh, the King of Crystal Skull, I believe it was called. Um, But this, this held up, man. This was really good. This was like, I even told my wife afterwards that this was like a great blockbuster summer, summertime night popcorn movie. Like, really kind of fulfilled what you look for in a summer night at the theater, like super action packed, always entertaining, never too cheesy. Um, Like, I mean, Indiana Jones films typically have a little, they got a little corn on them. They're a bit cheesy at times, but um, this one did, it it like kind of hit that, those like really important notes of being like action packed, good action sequences, believable, um, believable plot and like plot development um, while also, you know, hitting those like supernatural fantastical stuff too that are in all all three of the first ones um and the fourth one for better or worse um but i could not recommend it enough it was such a good experience at the theater again uh, i was happy that that was the one that welcomed us back so just want to give a big thumbs up to that because it was it was great nice yeah so keep your uh if you got if listen if you see oppenheimer and like I got a feeling most people are going to want to see Oppenheimer a couple times. So you go to the theater and see that and you might, might circle back to it again. But uh, if, if you are looking for something other than Oppenheimer or Barbie at the theater, 
old Harrison Ford still kicking around, beating some ass. Um, so you can check that out at the theater. Uh, big thumbs up from me. Um, Errol, I, I got a feeling that you haven't had a chance to watch any other new films uh, recently other than the uh, work we have done for The Lighthouse. Is that, is that the case? Oh, yeah, very much so. All good, all good. I've been at it. You know how I am. Um, I've been at it. And play, I've got like this list of like, it's one hell of a list of films, but I've had like a good time watching these because my wife hasn't seen a lot of this stuff. So like, it's nice to go back and watch some of these classics. But uh, so the films that I have seen, I'm going to recommend every single one of them other than the last one. Um, but the four that I've seen most recently with my wife were, I got to show her the first two Godfathers, which big must, like you got to see those. Um, and there are, uh, I will say the, the first one is more entertaining and boy, I would love to do, we'll definitely do those films. Like we have to, have you seen them by the way? Yeah. When I was like 11. Younger. Yeah. Yeah. Those are, those are ones that like, you got to revisit and you got to like, you got to just disappear into them for a couple hours. Um, but like, they're just unbelievable films. And I know that that's like a very obvious thing for most of American culture around movies. Like the Godfathers are obviously, um, I would hazard to say I genuinely um, this is a, a bit of a bold statement and I don't know that I totally embody it on it but I would hazard to say while it's not my favorite film of all time it's hard to argue that The Godfather Part 2 is not the best film I've ever seen like the best film ever made in terms of writing like the just the, the compilation of all talents coming together at once making a genuinely perfect film that moves at the perfect pace it goes back in time the performances like everything put together it's it's a perfect film it's as close to a perfect film as you'll ever see so i obviously i don't need to recommend the godfathers i'm pretty sure everybody everybody's into those um or at least aware of them would, uh, uh, yeah that's what i was gonna say at least yeah. anyone I mean, here they're probably Right. If you're really listening to a film podcast of any kind, even if it's our like par partial film podcast, you probably are uh, a fan and you know, there's good reason for it. And I, and we'll definitely, I think we'll definitely, we'll get to it. We'll get to that film or at least both the first two and completely ignore the third because it was trash. But uh, um, <laughs> also watched Ordinary People uh, from 1980, like that family psychological film. Um, great, great film. I had seen it a couple times. Uh, that one's, heartthrobber you know it's one of those like tug at your heartstring films it's it's some powerhouse acting performances in that one that's great all the president's men um we got to watch that again and that one's also just like very dialogue heavy um but like somehow just like unbelievably entertaining and and similar to a nolan film in that like do not like miss a beat because you will you know that movie will leave you very confused as to what's going on if you're like half paying attention um and uh, currently I'm a student right now and I actually just took a, I'm taking a, a radical film course um, over the summer. And the film, one of the, the first film for the class was a film called Chappaqua. Um, it's like this weird 1960s exploitation film about like uh, drug addiction and alcoholism. And it's like, it's very like uh, very political and sociological and it's got a lot of messages about it and I actually wrote a, a little thing on it and you know what, maybe I could actually post that I could link that to our Twitter if anybody's interested in what I had to say about the film because it was uh, there was a lot going on with it and uh, it was I don't know that I'd recommend it it's not it's not like a fun watch it's kind of weird and bizarre and you know oh no so and the and uh, yeah the lighthouse is uh, not a uh... No. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, this is no, I'm well, the lighthouse is like gorgeous. Like this is not this is not pretty. This is like like it's like very like spliced together in like very low budget. The lighthouse had some money to work with and also 2019 technology where this is like 1966 and we're like splicing shit together and you get what you get. Yeah, listen, he did what he it's it actually became a like a cult film. It's got like a lot of uh, attention um since then and um, it had a lot, to, a lot of interesting things to say, but that's as much as I can really say about it um, that I hadn't already written. So, um, speaking of The Godfather, though, while I don't really remember much from it, sure. um, I read somewhere recently that uh, Francis uh, Cap Capola went to a, uh, he went to like a film school. Like after he was done directing it, he wanted like tips or something. And the guy teaching the class, he was like, "Just watch The Godfather." And he's like, "What do you?" What do you mean? <laughs> he's like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> he's like, I need you didn't know who he was. Yeah, like he just like he was like, oh, have you seen that? Just like do what he did. And he's like, 
so can I just get my money back? Like, what the? Yeah, fuck? I'm dropping out. <laughs> I'm dropping out. I want a refund. Give me my money back right now. Why? How about I give you a degree? That's what he should have said. <laughs> I'm like, give me, give me the hat. Give me the chalkboard. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to leave, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, he's such an interesting human. Like he's, um, he's got like this, I think he's more rich now from his, like, he's got this like very, very successful wine company um, out of like uh, the vineyards. And I believe uh, Napa Valley in California, or it might even be in Italy. I don't, I'm not sure where he's based. I think it's Napa Valley, but um also, a further anecdote, my dad did like a an ancestry.com thing. And I, I think that like I'm trait my my ancestry is like traced to that name and in, in part of the same part. And like my great grandmother is from the p- same part of Sicily that his heritage is from. So like there was like an indication that potentially they have like I got some I got some of that copal blood in me. I'm not really mm-hmm. sure, but you know, you can never trust that stuff too much, but um yeah. I hope so. That'd be that'd be like. Listen, if there's one filmmaker who I wouldn't mind sharing DNA with, and I don't mean that in a way that's oh whoa, whoa, yeah, what <laughs> no. ancestry? Day. You can literally say just related to. <laughs> I'm not trying to touch that old man. That would oh. be for another podcast. Who do we want to? What director? What directors are we trying to? Are we top trying to t- top ten hottest directors? <laughs> He would not make my top ten list. I'm gonna be honest with you. He's he's. Uh, it would he's be weird now. Man. Well, listen. Like, well, especially yeah, it would make it very weird. Especially, I mean, that's we're talking. All right, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna pull the plug on this part of the podcast here. So <laughs> let's uh let's keep moving forward away uh-huh. from. Uh... <laughs> Are you disappointed? No, I'm just. Uh, <laughs> All right, uh, moving into the next uh, the next segment here. Let's talk film in 2019. Um, I don't know, a weird year for movies, in my opinion, kind of up and down. There was like a lot of, um, I mean, I had, you, you've got the list, Daryl. What, what did you think, uh, what stuck out Stuck out for you? I'll let you kick it off. So I'll start with the stuff that was like uh, probably really good, but I didn't see it or that didn't mm-hmm. like pop out. Like, of course, like Toy Story 4, uh, Frozen 2, The Lion King. Yeah, um, a lot of kids stuff the, that year. Right. I guess The Irishman was pretty good, but I didn't see that. I can attest to that. It was not as good, I think, as the world perceived it. I'd like to watch it again, but it's like four hours long, so I haven't circled back to that yet. But right. it was good. I like I liked what I saw, but I wasn't, you know, ecstatic. Then you got a uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, which Never you can't saw really, you can't really I don't imagine you can really mess up a documentary about a prolific figure. So Oh, it was a, well, I actually no, it was a biopic. It wasn't I don't think they it wasn't like a, Oh yeah, no, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, not a biopic. That, I think I, th- I figured that's what you meant. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I mean you. that story is pretty interesting. I'm like it's a rock and roll story. This was tough to mess it up. Yeah, I'm with you. Right. Um Black Klansman with uh, Adam Driver if I'm not mistaken. I didn't see that. Hella good. Hella like I mean real good. Like that was that was that's Spike Lee. Um I saw that I in had, the theater. That was a blast. That that movie's so, hilarious. I'm glad that you had, like, you didn't have the movie ruined for you because I didn't see it. But all I saw, it was like a TikTok or something. And I, I quit. I, it wasn't because of, I didn't delete TikTok because of that, but it was just like one of the things adding up to where I'm like, all right, I'm done with this. But uh, yeah. what happened was it was like, dang, uh, Kylo Ren snaps in the new movie. And it's just that scene where he's shooting at the car, like, just. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah hurling yeah, expletives, yeah. and I'm just like, oh, I can't stand like the kids on this app. I'm like, this is just yeah, this they just ruin everything. everything. They just ruin everything. This generation Spoiler. ruins everything. Well, it's yep. also, I mean, listen, it's not a total. I mean, it is a spoiler for sure. Um, but like, you can still get a lot of enjoyment out of watching movies that are spoiled, in my opinion, because like, you, usually when they're getting spoiled, they're usually well out of context. Um, I mean, you you don't like to go into a movie kind of knowing the direction it's going to take, especially with like a, a protagonist or a main character, but you can still get a ton of enjoyment out of that film. It's fucking entertaining, like front to back. And it's got a lot of um, social commentary and it's 20, it came out in 2019. Spike Lee had a lot to say about like the social causes going on in 2019. So it was, especially with like the racial tension that year um, and, the, and the next year too, more specifically, but um, yeah, it was great. It was a great film. Um, my personal favorite, uh, I've got three. My my top three, it's tough to put them in order, but I, I guess if I had to put them in order, it would go uh, Green Book was 
Green Book was so good. I can't even describe it to you. Like I was, I was so thrilled to watch that movie because it, it, and the reason that it, I, I loved it so much. And I know that it got kind of like mixed reviews in a way. I mean, it won best picture that year at the Academy Awards. Dang, um, that's but a- people were, people were kind of upset because it's like, um, I don't know. There were some like racial undertones. Like I said, it was a tough year for like racial tensions in the country, but, um, it, the film itself was like, it, you know, it was kind of like a, I thought it did a good job of like trying to add it, like maybe he, not doing a, not that it did this, but like contributing to the healing of those racial tensions because it like, it showed like the unification of black and white in America, even in a time when it was, uh, you know, difficult to do that because I think the film took place in like the sixties, I believe. Um, but with Viggo Mortensen and it was the Fairley brothers from who are, who are responsible for like dumb and dumber. And like, there's something about Mary and me, myself. Oh, so and they took a, yeah, we're talking about them. If not last podcast and the one before. Yeah, they're great. They're like, they made these awesome like nineties comedies and then they made this like semi-serious, but also pretty funny movie. Viggo uh, Mortensen from Watertown, New York um, was great. And he got nominated for an Oscar. He was fantastic. Um, and so was, um, uh, ah, what's the guy's name? Last name, Ali Mahersa, uh, Mahershala, Mahershala Ali. He was, uh, he was excellent in it too. Um, and they, the film is like very feel good and people were pissed off about it. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's just the, uh, sphere of internet that I was um, engaging with that was pissed off about it. But, um, I thought it was great. I thought it was a really feel good movie. There was a kind of a Christmas tone to it too. And it came out around that time. So um, okay. really, really, really good movie. Big recommend. Obviously uh, Joker came out that year and that shit was fucking amazing. I don't right. Did you see Joker? You must've saw Joker, right? Oh yeah. Oh, also I was going to say, if we didn't talk about um, the uh, Fairley brothers uh, in the last couple uh podcasts, it's because we were thinking about just doing a, like a brother uh, omnibus. Like just of all the silly, goofy movies. Oh yeah, there's so much of them. Yeah. Oh yeah. We and we absolutely could like rank. That could be a ranking show. We could rank the Fairly Brothers like all their movies because there's so fucking many. And there's like, I mean, there's a solid, there's a solid six or seven that are genuinely good, like very good. Um, yeah. They've got some. They've got some busts in there too. But yeah, no, they're they're great. Um, but yeah, anyway. no, I keep the Joker. Um, before we get into the meat and potatoes, because. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's only one there that's like probably legitimately better than the uh, than the Joker. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, Avengers Endgame just because that that was mm. that was pretty Endgame. fun. That was a really fun time for anyone mm-hmm. who was uh, along for the ride there. Um, I liked it uh, just because I was so invested in everything and uh, Black Panther. I thought Great. it came out at a really interesting time. Yeah, they kind of nailed it too. It was a big year for like racial uh, racial conversation. In right, and uh, what they did, I liked how they kind of flipped it on its ear. Where like, um, you know, uh, Wakanda was just xenophobic, and they're like, we don't want to help anyone else out in the world. We we're just going to focus on ourselves. Like you know, just isolationists. On, yeah, isolationists yeah. focused on a uh, nationality and like xenophobia. They're like, you know, outsider. Like you know, yeah. what, what do you like? You know, and then they slowly decided like hey maybe it's better if we you know kind of and i thought it was i thought it was really nice having like that like flip-flop there it makes sure it, yeah it had a nice like inverse i actually only saw it uh when it came out and I've, i haven't seen it since and to be honest i don't really remember much from it um it didn't lay that big of an impression on me but uh, i remember being like i remember the visuals being pretty stunning um yeah. but also, the, yeah, the plot is chadwick yeah i know r.i.p he was he was amazing he played Jackie Robinson for God's sakes, man. He was he was a talented dude. It was uh that's a that's a tragedy. But um yeah, the superhero movies, even Avengers Endgame, I just like I didn't I saw Infinity War with you, I believe. And that was that's literally the only Avengers movie I've seen. Um I liked it, but there's just I think it's just a saturated market for me. Oh I now now yeah. as someone who does like it, it's uh I'm it's oversaturated. I've seen too much stuff. I'm not invested anymore. It's yeah. I feel bad because like if you were to ask like you know like 
like even like 15 year old me i'd be like dude that's so sick that they're portraying all these people and they and it's right. disney so they have the money the money to uh do more make obscure them characters and, and like, they can yeah, make like, them good they like they have enough of, like they offer enough of, of a budget to the filmmakers to make like the best version that that's possible but, but man, there's so many filmmakers I've, making so many movies i've, which is I've grown funny. up with it dude i've seen spider-man in seven different iterations like what the yeah like, it's what? too much yeah, it's too yeah. much, and it's 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 not that disappointing to me because I'm not really huge uh, into superhero comics or or the films. I never have. Like, obviously, I, like you know, I'm a I'm a big Batman guy. I like everything that Batman's. I love the Batman movies in the '90s and the comics and the the Robert ones, Pattinson's but... last one. If you did, yeah, you got that. Patton, yeah, circling Batman. Another connection to today's film. Um, but uh, no, I, I but I feel for what I was trying to say was I feel for the superhero fans in America. And where the state of that shit's going. Either you love it because you're just getting so much, or you're like you, which I think is a lot of people where they're just like, this is um this market is now like so flooded with like um new characters and characters of old being redone and reshaped. And I don't know, it feels to me like I've noticed this a lot with even TV shows and and just everything in media. I it's a little disappointing to see how how few original ideas there are. Nihil Nave Sub Soul. There is nothing new under the sun. They're just taking ideas and redoing them. They really are, and that's why. And that's why a film like The Lighthouse is like so uh, breathtaking because talk about a unique and original idea. Although not completely well, original. Yeah, it's loosely based, based on, off a bunch of things. But no film had been had, like there's uh, there's other iterations. This is technically a remake because it has been done. Um, there were earlier renditions of the film, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, Largely, the film is, and its vision, the Eager's vision is so unique. It stands, it stands totally alone. Like you can't, I would never, I could never put this film in in the camp of like, wow, I can't believe they made another one of those. Like <laughs> it's just so bizarre and unique in its own way. And we'll we'll talk about that. But I would, I did want to have one more quick film from 2019 that I think was, in my opinion, the best film of that year, and that was Me 1917. Too. Yeah, I'm there with you. You with me on that one? Yeah, 1917. The I think it's like the whole film was two shots. I know that was like the thing for the film, but like that that's that ability of filmmaking from Sam Mendes to like do a film like that, like a Saving Private Dude. Line, where the whole film is two shots, is like it's un right. it's unheard of. And so, talk about unique ideas, right? So I was enthralled with the Joker. Absolutely loved it. Like I would Likewise. give the Joker like a like a nine, dude, nine and a half. Uh, I might too. I might Nineteen, too. yeah, but Joker didn't do that. Shit didn't have me like in like emotional. Like I was like in like tears like yeah. with that. Like it was uh, yeah. it was a lot easier for me to like you know put myself in that situation. You're just thinking like you get drafted to war. Like you have a brother and another like you know. Mm -hmm. in another platoon you're like i just gotta find him you're like it's gonna be fine because i'm just like gonna go and find him and it's like i don't know dude it's it's rough like you just you there have been he doesn't want to he doesn't want to be there <laughs> he, <doesn't laughs> he does do not it. well they also have like i mean there's just we, we we could do a podcast on that film we we definitely probably should but i would say there's three there are three war films that have come out and probably well, let's see this would be the last five years five or six years total there are three war films that I genuinely consider to be three of the top five greatest war films ever. And that, and those three are Dunkirk, which we talked about. Um, we haven't done a film, an, an episode on it, but we talked about the film a little bit in uh, the previous film episode. Um, 1917 and All Quiet on the Western Front. I was going to say, I knew it was All Quiet. Year. All three of those films are truly all-time greats. I can't believe that, like... They don't. Um, I know that war films. There's a lot of war films, and I'm. They kind of died out a little bit, though. Like they they stopped really making them, um, uh, especially like big budget ones were just not a thing. So now when they do make them, I think and and there were a lot of World War II movies from like 1981 until probably 2008 or so, and then they kind of just stopped making them. Um, I mean, they did they, not entirely, of course, but like the big, the bigger ones in the in the critically acclaimed ones kind of disappeared for a little while there. But um, boy, those three, and I know they're not all World War Twos. Um, Seventeen is World War One, so it's all quiet in the Western Front. But they are those three films. Boy, they will leave you shaking. <laughs> they will rattle your bones. Truly, I mean, they are they're tough to watch. They're riveting. 
Um, I think Dunkirk, in my opinion, is the best of the three. I think Dunkirk's – I'll wait until I see Oppenheimer, but at this point in the game, I think Dunkirk was the best thing Christopher Nolan's ever done. Better, yeah, no, better. That's, so the thing is, too, that movie's PG-13. Yeah, like he managed to do it like very commercially uh, available. Like there's not a lot of blood or gore. It's a war film, but it's just – it's the it's the sound editing and the um just the shot sequence that like it just pulls you in where you actually feel like you're in the and the, the way it cuts in between each character i mean there's a ton we can we're not gonna uh, you know i i don't want to do a disservice to that film by trying to chalk it up into a couple sentences here but like i will say when we saw that i saw that with you in the theater and it was like mm-hmm. jesus man i remember like my palms being like sweaty watching man it. i felt wet <laughs> not from like I, like okay from like right, the water is, and that's stuff. you now now you're up now yeah you're okay no we gotta yourself. we gotta relax we gotta start thinking about what we're saying no yeah. i felt like uh like gross like i felt soggy from like you know i felt like i was in the boat i'm like man this is rough yeah another killian murphy though i mean man he, he's he's had an amazing resurgence of his career he was the scarecrow um but goddamn that movie yeah well, 17, 1970 did the same thing. I remember seeing that in the theater and being just like gripped by it, just totally gripped by it. Like you, you I mean, can't look, you can't not be gripped by it because because of how it's shot. It never gives, right. a, it never stops. It's just boom, boom, bam, boom, bam, yeah. and that's dude. It's, just, that, it's forceful. It's just it, forceful. Yeah. Like All Quiet on the Western Front was like a good mix of the two because it like calmed down and there's like these beautiful moments. But that's a team. more that's a more accurate like description of or like a feel for like trench warfare. Yeah, yeah, like I would say that's nothing. true. You're just hanging out, and then it is everything. It's just yeah. I think over. All Quiet on the Western Front was a really good, um, yeah, like you said, it's like a very good representation of what war was probably like because it shows like the downtime um, in between battles. Whereas like 1917 and Dunkirk work as films better. Like yeah, as like films, they tell a whole they, story. Yeah, they like they come in like breakneck speed and like just kick your ass for two and a half hours. Whereas all quiet on the Western front will like, it kind of pulsates. It, it, well, that's, it's one of the only ways you can actually like give like the fog of war in like a film is by like yeah. having the downtime, like what's going on, what's the next attack going to be like those get ga- the gas attacks. Like that, that's, that's oh terrifying. I, absolutely. Yeah. The mustard gas scenes are just like, Jesus, especially when they're in the bunkers. Like, Dude. good lord, it's just horrifying. It's just a horrifying and heralding experience to watch those films. And you gotta Reaching imagine for someone's that, gas mask, and you're like, "Give me yours." <laughs> I'll take anybody's because it's life or death. Like, mm-hmm. well, you know that like most all three of those films don't happen, and they don't look the way they look without saving Private Ryan. Oh yeah, like, that's period. That's that's not even debatable. Like Spielberg is basically in some way responsible for those types of war movies existing because he. He shook the entire country up with Saving Private Ryan, where like, like war, war, World War II veterans were going into the theater in 1996 or 95, whenever that came out, and like not being able to sit through the, the Normandy scene. Like their PTSD was like being like, um, it was like resurging because like that film was too, it was too realistic. Like they were like, obvi- it was like kind of like when The Passion of the Christ came out, where like, people would just come out of the theater sobbing because right like, because how it was just, just too intense and too unrelenting. real too yeah. much reality like way too close to real and like unrelenting and like i actually get that a lot like i understand that it's a film and like you know uh, you could be critical in some way that like just recognize that it's a film and it's not real but like if you if you walk out of the theater and a movie has moved you in that way to bring you to tears or sobbing uh you've done a good job as the viewer you know that, that's my opinion i don't i don't look down on people that like can't take that means they they let the film absorb them they were like right. just take me in with you like they just they they let go it's kind of meditative in that way like they sit down and they dissolve in you the allow film. you allow yourself to truly feel like what you and the feeling. filmmakers gotta love that too because the filmmakers like everything i worked for that's the audience capture i'm looking for where i'm like give like disappear into this film that i've worked so hard on and give me your full attention whereas like i don't think that happens much these days with you know cell phones i'll tell you what man i'll tell you what it's a lot harder ever since i started acting like i'll watch like like daytime like uh like dramas and i'm like these guys are just 
after a paycheck, man. I was like, they're just a popular name. They're not like active. They're just yeah. reading the script. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough to see. Cause it's so tough to it's, see because the, because you know what the limp like you like you know what the upper bound limit is like the ceiling. If you yeah. get, if you get there, you wind up with a movie like Lighthouse. Where, exactly. Like, so I fi- I find myself just being like, oh, like all I had to do is just actually care like a little bit more in the acting. So it's a it's a double edged sword. It's a there's a silver lining to it because while more of the media I see is not through rose colored glasses the stuff that does get me involved is so much better because at the end I'm like, Oh my God, like I was, they brought me into a time period. Well, yeah. Which... It's so, it's so great because that's what like, that's what books do. That's what fucking mm-hmm. novels do. And, and it's tough. I, I'm, I'm just as much a victim as anybody else, but like, like I don't read novels anymore at all. I have a hard enough time, like piecing through a fucking nonfiction book, but like, like I miss reading novels. Cause I remember, I remember back in the day, like back in high school and a little bit a few years after high school, like in my early twenties, reading quite a bit of, of, uh, of fiction and being like, and disappearing into a different time period or a different location. Like reading the example I always give when I explain this is the sun also rises, which takes place in like Paris and the lead char- the protagonist is, uh, his name is Jacob, which is, I share that name with the character. So I could like, I remember like I, I sunk my eyes into that story by uh, Ernest Hemingway and I like, I disappeared in the book and I remember just like all of a sudden, like 140 pages were gone. And I was just like, and I finally lifted my head and I was, I was back to reality. And it was just like, God, like there's nothing like that. And films, film can do that in a lot of ways. If you're, if your filmmakers and your actors and your writers are all given it everything they've got. Uh, But as an audience, you got to choose to do that too. You can't you can't show up to the film with your laptop out and your computer out and or your uh, um, I'm sorry your, your phone out and like barely pay attention and ex- and then I saw because that's half the thing is like you get people who are watching the film sorry to interrupt but like you get like people who are watching the film and then they'll walk and they're but they're half scrolling Twitter on their phones and then they'll leave the theater and be like this movie fucking sucked and it was like yeah, I, you, you didn't pay attention to anything even yeah. if you could say it sucked but at least pay attention to it. I, I saw this one thing. Um, I forgot exactly who said it, but they were like a uh, when you get a movie ticket, it's a commitment to do nothing but watch that movie. Like you can rent something at your house, but it's a lot easier to like you know get some housework done, kind yeah, of sure. like you know do some other stuff, get like you know make yourself a drink, have a little do whatever you want. But like when you go to the movie theater, you got your popcorn, you got the drink, you mute your phone, and then like. It's just a commitment to do that. You're going to watch the film for what it's worth. If you can't stand it, then like walk out. But like, I I think it's so disingenuous when someone pays money for a ticket and they're like, oh, I'll just go on my cell phone, which like you know will ruin the lighting. Got that? Just like bright light there. Yeah. But they're like, oh, I paid for it. Everyone else did, and they did that just so they could kind of get away from everything. Yeah. For, you ever for been to what, what's your worst? Um, this is great. Cause this is like a total uh, like nerd out film conversation, but like, what's your worst experience at the theater? Like, yeah. But, Cause I have one in mind for myself, but I'm curious what, uh, like what's your worst movie going experience cinematically? So I would have to say there's this, uh, I, I have two, one of them was just typical, like, you know, teenagers just like talking like to the point where I was going to like say something, but I didn't because mm-hmm. I'm a coward, but either way, like ended up. <laughs> no, you're just, the movie listen, though. being non-confrontational is fine. And like, it's just not worth it. Cause you're just, it, you, you got to look at the end result. It's like, what, what's, are you going to be like, Hey guys, I'm really trying to watch this movie. Could you be, you could do it the nicest way possible. And they're, they're not going to listen. Either to way. They're going to take you away from the movie even more. Cause then even further, like, cause now you're going to stew, especially right. however they react back to you. It's, it's like, just do your best to just ignore them and then try to try to and disengage with it. That's the best move. But yeah. But the second one, I don't even want to say it's the worst cause it was wicked funny. But it's definitely the worst thing I've seen in the movies. I went to see like one of the Jurassic Park movies. Uh, one of the like, uh, I want to say like the second one, like Jurassic Park 2 or Jurassic Park 3, maybe. And mm. these guys were sitting in like the side two seats and they had a, a tub of popcorn. And before the movie even started, they would take the popcorn, dump it on the floor. And then the other guy would go get a refill. And then they come back, they dump it on the floor, then get a refill. Dude, they did that like, like five, six times. And 
the popcorn was just like up to the seat. Like it was like there was a oh pile of popcorn. And like I was there with my uncle, we're just looking over, like flabbergasted. Like no one wanted to tell him to stop because they just want to see how far it's gonna go, but they're just laughing, just throwing the popcorn on the ground. They're like, if I'm paying for it, I'm getting my money's worth. <laughs> That's insane. Did they were they eating it off the floor? Like I don't understand what like the benefit. No, I think What's they I think they were just looking for attention because they like they ended up getting kicked out when because I'm telling you they did this while the lights were on. It wasn't like let's be. Oh, they weren't even. Yeah, they were yeah. looking to be. They were looking we, to be funny. We came into the movie theater just pile of popcorn and then they just <laughs> they kept going back and forth and then like yeah the guy comes through with the, with the stick and he's like dude. Yeah, what's that poor bastard gonna say to you? Like, guys, just get the fuck out. Just you gotta out. clean. You gotta clean a literal like whole bin of popcorn, like a whole like tin of it on the floor. Yeah, whole trash that's, bag. That's some shitty. That's some shitty behavior. Yeah, you see a lot of that. I don't. I don't recall. I've been to so many movies. I don't really recall like the, what the worst is. But like recently, I remember going to see. Um, Jeez, it's tough to remember. It might have even been Joker, actually. Now that we're talking about it, because I, I was Joker. like, I know. <laughs> Well, yeah, nice. Um, and it, it it was one of it was either Joker or um, Chris. There was a I know what theater it was, and I only saw a couple of movies in that theater. I think it was Joker. We'll just say it was, and it was um, it was just the same story. Just people, just just a couple of folks behind us, just like the they were just like laughing. They were just la- it was just like I am not trying to be quiet at all. I'm just gonna laugh as loud as I possibly can. And we are talking, whatever we're joking about, it has nothing to do with the film. We're going to do this for two hours straight. Just the whole thing. I was just like, why even, Why are you even here? Why did you waste your money? Like, I don't even understand. Like, it, like go, to the, go to a church or some shit. Like, you're like a child in church. Like, you know, that's what kids in church do during mass. They, like, sit in the back and chuckle at each other because it's like you're not supposed to laugh. But, like, why would you spend money to go just, like, chuckle in the back row for two hours? Like that one, I don't get is like I you spend your own money to go to the theater and like I don't know, it just doesn't seem worth it to like, and you're also bothering other people, so like, what I just don't get it. I don't see what the I don't know. Some people just fall into the spell of like that's like a spell of of laughter sometimes where like you just can't yeah. you get into a laughing fit and it's over, but like I don't know. And then it's you like ever the been to a place. two a two hour one, you ever been to a two hour laughing fit? That's absurd to me. I, I don't even know how that's possible, but that's what I experienced. Yeah, um, I did. Mm, it's, it's, rough. Know, it's rough. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, bizarre. But uh, anyway, so 2019, a pretty monster year uh, for film. Um, like you said, you kind of hit the big ones. The box, excuse me, the box office uh, hits were were Avengers, Lion King, Frozen Two, Toy Story Four. Um, the weakest one of the bunch, um, as far as I'm concerned, but still very good. Um, but definitely not as the three. The first three were like. My, my daughter is obsessed with them and I'm, I couldn't be happier to watch a, a kid's movie. Those three, the first three are just so good. I, I don't mind watching them anytime. Um, they're great. Uh, but the fourth one was still good, but not like, not quite on that level. Um, what else came out that year? Just before we move on, a star is born came out. I thought that sucked. Um, my opinion, I know that's an unpopular one. A lot of people like that movie, but I thought it sucked. Dave Chappelle's good in it. But, um, I did not. Uh, I did not enjoy it. Uh, Vice came out that year. That was Christian Bale playing Dick Cheney. Uh, mm-hmm. You remember that one? That was uh, that was okay. It was okay. It was like um, a little too political for me. I kind of got the sense that they were more interested in pushing a, a you know a, a political message that I actually probably agree with. But like, I mean, Dick Cheney was just like an evil bastard, and like I think there were. I would have preferred it to just be a little less like. Um, about trashing the piece of shit that Dick Cheney was and a little bit more about like being like as historically accurate, just like, I just play it straight. It, it's more legitimate. If you just play it straight, instead of like, just like constantly trying to ensure like, we all know Dick Cheney's back out. Like most of the country is pretty aware that like Dick, Dick Cheney was like pretty rotten and had some like is a billionaire on like Raytheon and all that. And mm-hmm. whatever else he was involved in. Um, but uh, easy money. You know why yeah. it's easy money? Because like they spend billions and it gets blown up. Military and so free dollars. Yeah, literally free. It's military industrial complex. It's the shit that Dwight, Dwight D. Eisenhower like warned everybody about when he was leaving office in the fifties, and it totally came true. But um, that aside, it was it was an okay film. It was like an enjoyable film in terms of that it was like, I guess entertaining. But um, I I just as far as those types of films go, um, especially if you're 
talking about a person, a, a, a biographical film that's like on a person who's still alive. Um, I guess it's just, I would, I would have preferred it to just be like play a little more down the middle, just focus on just telling the story um, instead of kind of just kind of like there's, cause there's actually scenes in the film, I believe that are like satirical and like intention. They're like not accurate intentionally. They're like more like fantastical to just kind of, um amplify what a bad guy he was and i just i could have done without that that's that's just me um uh that's basically it oh one more uh if beale street could talk that was that was fantastic um that was really 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 good like a, it was like a romance about uh a young black couple in i believe uh louisiana new orleans um and it's uh a romance romantic film but like it had a lot it, once again a lot of racial stuff in the film to uh, sink your teeth into that was like really captivating at the time, especially in 2019 holds up pretty well today too. Um, so give that a peek. Pretty good year for film. What do you think? Like one of, I, I feel like this was kind of the end of a, of a pretty good run in cinema. This was like kind of the last pretty solid year. I think things kind of tapered off in the next couple of years and they're, uh, uh, I mean, COVID probably had a lot to do with that too, but I feel yeah. like things are, things are starting to ramp up now. Right. You think so? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, no, no, because the writers. Uh, oh right. Well, yeah. The I writers mean, strike. Yeah, that's no, true. Yeah, they, they were. were but the, no. the writers strike is definitely going to hold things up. But I just mean, what's what is coming out and what has come out in like this year and probably the last like twelve months has been like much better, better direction. Oh yeah. So on that note, that's the that's the uh, that's our section on uh, the film the film scene in twenty nineteen. So uh, with that we've uh we've covered all of our bases our introduction is complete that being said we're going to take a short break Aaron and i are going to step away for just a moment when we come back we are talking about a 2019 absolute masterpiece the lighthouse written and directed by robert eagers hang tight and we'll be right back <laughs> folks welcome back we are talking robert eager's 2019 uh sophomore film his follow-up to the witch um uh, the lighthouse this is a monster film in terms of what to discuss a um where to begin is is almost difficult but let's let's talk about robert eager's for just a quick moment before we dive too deep into the film because we are definitely going to do that 
um, Robert Eager's um, his debut film. A um, lot of the same. You, you saw the first two films that he put out, which were the which was The Witch and then Lighthouse, and like they both kind of followed in each other's footsteps a little bit because of the uh, specifically for the, the script purposes. Um, using authentic language from the time in which they they took place. Um, but I wanted to ask you, Errol, have you seen The Witch? Has that hit your radar? Have you uh, gotten a chance to see that at any point? No, but I've seen The Northman, and the one take I have on uh, the uh, Eagers Brothers is they are like set period place like gods. Like there, yeah, for sure. uh-huh. there's not a yep. lot of other people out there making like more authentic feeling, like just take you away to like a distant place. place. Yeah. Well, he's obsessed. And, I, and in a couple of interviews, I, I listened to him. He's like, he's very, very, very meticulous about historical accuracy. And this, they this wove, is, they mm-hmm. wove the sweaters for the lighthouse. The God damn. I did department. not know that. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean that's an authentic authentication of, of filmmaking. You're just not going to get from another filmmaker in this era, um, um, and it's. I mean, it's just he's he's uh, one of the more promising filmmakers. I'm glad we're talking about him so early in the podcast because I do think he is the guy to watch. Um, but speaking of uh, speaking of the Northman, uh, so you did see the Northman. That was the follow up film to this. Um, and I, I loved it. It got weird reviews. Like uh, Some people loved it. Some people thought it was like kind of like uh, gore porn or like like it was you know, not no. torture porn, but like, you I know, don't, I don't think I so. I didn't think the violence was accessible. The violence was it was a little um, in excess because of the time period in which the film like it's basically you know, um, Hamlet, right? Like the story is Hamlet. Yeah, Hamlet. pretty much. And it's it's almost like people are just so used to like the gun violence of just pull your finger and then someone goes on the ground. Like the human body is frail and resilient. Like everybody's nude in that film. Everybody's got their shirt off. Somebody's get like, you see it all. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, But like what, that's what makes the filmmaking so like impressive is because it's really like um, it's beautifully shot. The Northman is a gorgeous film in terms of the lighting. And like, um, actually I, I call, I say that it's Hamlet, right? But I believe what I read was that this the film was actually based on the on a Nordic tale of which Hamlet was actually based by Shakespeare. Shakespeare wrote Hamlet like actually after this supposed Nord- Nordic tale. So like oh. Shakespeare fucking better than if he got that copyright infringement. Well, no, that's just there. everything's a retelling, just like the lighthouse here. We just yeah, we just said that. Like, like I yeah, said too, neat. And Shakespeare's I'm sure. Sub- I'm sure that the version written by Bill Shakespeare was, uh, <laughs> I'm sure that it was an improvement upon the original Nordic, you know, tell, nice, storytelling. Nice but. enough tale to inspire him, though. But yeah, no, like I said. Must have been good. Must have been good, yeah. No, nothing new under the sun. There's no feeling that hasn't been felt before. There's no archetype that hasn't, that's going to just emerge tomorrow in some person. Yeah, and like the theory, also the theory of theory that to, that kind of like placates that in some ways is that anything that hasn't happened eventually will, or could anything that could happen that hasn't happened eventually will. Should enough time lapse, I mean that's that's um, like philosophically true. Um, but uh, anyway, so the Northman uh, was a great film. I, I thought it was great. So he's three for three in my book. Um, forthcoming though is, and I don't know when this is scheduled to come out. I think they're wrapped on the production side of things. Um, when the release date is, I'm not sure. But he has uh, remade Nosferatu, um, which is the original Dracula, basically. Um, and he actually did. That was actually his first film, I guess. He made like a. I don't know if it was a short film or it was like an indie film that just never really made it um, or couldn't get budgeted. So I don't know if he actually got finished the project, but I know that it was in his wheelhouse early in his career. And now he's revisiting it with like a bigger budget. And because of the success of his first three films, he's going to take all that success and roll it right into Nosferatu. Um, I'll be curious to see if anybody like works. I mean, come on, it, it works perfect for him. Like that's him, right? Like he's got that, he's got that, that market. That's, that seems to be his style of filmmaking. I think he'll do a great job with it. Yeah. No, I'm excited for that too. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So sinking into the lighthouse, uh, 2019, 
written and directed by Robert Eagers, written also alongside him. It was his brother, Max, Max Eagers, that wrote it together. Uh, you got your cast number. <laughs> the, I mean, the cast is uh, it, literally the whole entire film is basically two characters. Uh, and, and I guess it's, there is a third character. There is a, a mermaid. Uh, the mermaid is played by um, Valeria Caramon. Um, there and, are multiple characters, at least multiple characters mentioned as far mm -hmm. as characters portrayed or physical characters. Uh, I would say there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight, if you count the seagulls. Right. Yeah. It's Cause they, and they represent a lot of things. So like they represent like the souls or whatever, but um, in terms of casting, in terms of like the acting, yeah. Like there, there are four characters, there are four characters with actors and then there are what Errol's going to dive deep into. And, and we're going to, we're going to piece apart is going to be the, the other um, attributable characters in the plot and the philosophy of the film. Um, but Let's let's just introduce uh, first and foremost Robert Pattinson as Ephraim Winslow slash Thomas Howard, um, and Willem Dafoe as Thomas Wake. Those are your two leading performances. Um, before we get into our theories, Errol, what did you think about just the pure fucking acting juggernauts that these two were, and uh, and what they what they were able to accomplish with this film? So I think uh, what they did was absolutely amazing. Um, how hard would it be to just just you and someone else just making a whole story uh and like a believable one uh it's i believe uh willem defoe approached uh, mr eagers and then i think uh he was also working with robert with something else or robert's like i want something really obscure and he was like if this isn't obscure enough or if this isn't challenging enough i don't know what like yeah. to offer you so they both yeah pattinson have... well pattinson pattinson specifically asked him he was like yeah like i'm not doing any blockbusters um like i'm looking to do something i'm looking to shift my career into doing something i see i, I think he put it um i'm paraphrasing but i think he i think he basically said he wanted to do something really fucking weird and yeah and he wanted to do it he wanted to he wanted to play a fucking crazy person and he's an eager sent him the script and was like, if, if you're looking to get crazier than this, then I don't know where you're going to find it. And he was like all in. Um, and so here's the thing. This is exactly what you get with a project of passion. This is exactly everyone involved wanted to be involved with it. And they, I don't think a single person cared if they, if they made money from this movie. Dude, down, down to the, like I was saying, down to the costume department, they were knitting those sweaters to make them mm -hmm. period accurate because they yep. couldn't find them anywhere else. Right. Yeah. Because it's, 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 well, let's, let's introduce the plot a little bit. So like basically the film um, and the film is about a lot, it's about a lot of things, but let's just, uh, I'll just introduce it in like the most rudimentary way I can. Um, it's basically um, visually it's, it's actually the plot is sourced particularly from a 19th century legend of a particular accident that happened in uh, Wales off the coast of Wales <laughs> Um, and it was uh, about a small lighthouse that uh, about 20 miles off the coast and um, two men, um, you know, there's the lighthouse keeper and then there's what's known as the wiki, uh, which I think is hilarious. That's such a great because uh, like the wick, like you're like you tend to yeah, the lighthouse you tend the, to, you, you tend the flame, you maintain the light. So the wiki is like such a cool name for that. Um, but basically the story is that the story goes as. Uh, two men stuck on an island, um, attending to a lighthouse, keeping to a lighthouse, maintaining the um, condition of the building and the operation operability of the of the light. So obviously ships can navigate. Um, they end up getting stranded, and um, the waters become too, uh, as it's quoted by uh, one of the characters, too rageful um, for rescue. They are stranded there for um, the amount of time is actually a little bit unclear. The folklore is um, in the original like story. I, I'm not really sure how long it, it's not indicated how long it is, but it, I guess the story takes place in like the early 19th century, like 1801. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. Almost. I think that's like a, the exact time period where they put it at. Uh, yeah. Just about right. Yeah. 
the reason for the apprehension was uh, they were known to publicly quarrel. So just two guys in a lighthouse, and then, yeah, there was an accident. One of them died. The and older suspicious. guy. Yeah, yeah so it was, he's like, it was I can't. suspicious how it happened. Yep, he's like, I can't just, I need to explain myself. He needs to, you know, be around. I need to, you know, make a coffin for him. And so, like, he did that so um, he could explain himself when they came by. So he didn't just, like, you know, throw him off the side of that lighthouse. And, uh, yeah. And I guess the guy, I guess when, I guess when the original character, like, returned home after being relieved of his duties, finally, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll read the story right now. Um, this is courtesy of obviously Wikipedia, but this is what this story, um, I'll read it off quickly because it's short on Wikipedia. This is the actual original story that inspired the lighthouse. Um, uh, the old lighthouse brought about a change in lighthouse policy in 1801 after a gruesome episode sometimes called the Smalls Lighthouse Tragedy. Thomas Howell and Thomas Griffin, both named Thomas, uh, the two-person team that managed the lighthouse were publicly known to quarrel. When Griffith, when Griffith died in a freak accident, Howell feared that if he discarded the body of the sea, authorities might accuse him of murder. As Griffith's body began to decompose, Howell built a makeshift coffin for the corpse and lashed, lashed it to an outside shelf. Stiff winds blew the box apart, and the body's arm fell within view of the hut's window. As the winds would blow, Gus would catch the arm and move it in a way that made the appendage appear to beckon. <laughs> in, spite of, in spite of his former partner's decaying corpse and working the lighthouse alone, Howell was able to keep the house, house's lamp lit. When Howell was finding, finally relieved of duty, the impact of the situation was so emotionally taxing that his friends did not recognize him. As a result, the governing body changed the lighthouse policy to make lighthouse teams rosters of three people, which continued until the automation of British lighthouses in 1980s. So um, that's the original story of what it's based on. And uh, He's just, this film just, takes that to a whole nother place, right? But that's crazy just because uh, uh, the whole time uh, uh, Thomas Howell was just uh, thinking that like, the dead body was just beckoning him. Calling him, like, yeah, calling on him. With and us. Yeah, yeah. so that's just literally as horrifying as it could possibly be, and, like, he was stuck with it for, like I said, it doesn't actually indicate how long he was on the island, um, but it's, if he was far enough, he's, you know, he's far enough away, 20 miles off the coast, um, so if that's, if, if you can attach that to this story, I, I would assume that that's probably pretty close um, so that's actually kind of the plot of the film. However, uh, in our film, it's a little quick, different. We, I'm sorry, go quick, ahead. Yeah, no, quick anecdote about that lighthouse before we uh, mm. uh, steer off it forever. There was a disaster in 1931 where the tower was assaulted by a wave of such proportions. The floor of the keeper's room was torn up and slammed against the ceiling, injuring the keepers one so badly that he just died. Boom, just dead. Uh the damage was repaired and the lighthouse survived another 30 years before they replaced replaced it. This the focal height is 118 meters. Yeah. So Jesus Christ. No, sorry, no, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. 36 meters. 118 feet. 118 feet. 118 feet. Yeah. This so like wave, here's my opinion. Tear that motherfucker down and build a new one. This well, place so, is cursed. You never kill a seabird. Right? Someone must have messed up there. So and like the thing is, though, if that wave came in, it was over eighty feet. If it wasn't a tsunami, like from an earthquake, that's just a rogue wave. That's just crazy yeah. wave out of nowhere sweeping over and just throwing you up against the ceiling. That's uh, that's Poseidon's trident. Yeah, yeah, right. So like, and we're gonna get, we'll we'll be getting into that here in a moment. Um, yeah, well, let me just introduce. I'll, I'll actually just tie that into. Um, the actual, um, so the film kind of does a little bit of tweaking to that, uh, to that, um, the lore of that original lighthouse story. Um, we push ahead to the 1890s or, or pushing ahead about 80 years or so. Um, and your lead character, Robert Pattinson playing Ephraim Winslow, um, which you later discover is, uh, a name adopted by a man he watched die his previous, um, employer. Uh, begins a four-week stint as a wiki on an isol isolated island off the coast of New England under the supervision of former sailor Thomas Wake. In his quarter, Winslow discovers a small scrimshaw of a mermaid and keeps it in his jacket. Wake immediately proves to be very demanding, subjecting Winslow to taxing jobs such as emptying the chamber pots, maintaining the machinery, carrying heavy kerosene tanks up the stairs, and painting the lighthouse while, bearing, while barring Winslow from the lantern room. 
So this is what kind of goes on. So he discovers, obviously, the uh, fetish item of the mermaid in the mattress, and he's getting basically tortured um, by by uh, by Thomas Wake, his employer, played by Will- Willem Dafoe, and uh, basically just forcing him to work, you know, work work like a dog, um, as he calls him a filthy dog. Um, but uh, so that's that's how things kind of kick off, and things just get weirder and weirder as the film progresses. I mean, um, the the darkness in which. Um, I mean, what did you think about? I guess a good place to start was like, what did you think about the like the fourth wall breaking uh, shot where they're both just like staring at the camera next to each other for the first time? It's like kind of the first time you see them together. What do you think about that shot? Yeah, it's um, it's a uh, reminiscent of uh, the two sailors painting. Yeah, I, not only that, but uh, well, for me, uh, yeah, I, I could see that. I could definitely see that. But what more so? What it reminded me of. Is and this is this is the acting right, and I think they were inspired. I think Defoe and uh, Pattinson were def- inspired by. Um, they must have gone back and done this, like went to like the eighteen nineties and looked at like whatever films they could find from that, because they do this amazing job where like people back then were so fucking awkward with cameras. Like I think that they they were trying to emulate in that scene that like it's almost like a breaking the fourth wall because. They're looking at the camera the same way that people used to look into a camera in the 1890s because it was just like this foreign technology. Like you're, you're not like, laugh, you're not smiling, you're not making a character. You're just no, you're just kind of looking at it, and your head's kind of like waving in in both directions back and forth, and you like a couple blinks, but you don't know to wait. Like if you ever look, there's a film called um, uh, "They Shall Not Grow Old" um, about, and it's basically Peter Jackson like. Um, refurnishing you might you've seen it i'm sure um Mm -hmm. well just to explain to the listeners like it's a film if you haven't heard of it it's a film that kind of like refurnished all of the old footage from world war ii or as much as could be found and um colorizing it and like cleaning it up and making it like hd and like it's the same thing like people just in the earliest early 20th century did did not really know how to interact with like cameras and this particular shot of our two um protagonists or antagonist or our one protagonist depending on your theories um staring into the camera just was so emblematic of like of like how people would look at cameras back then like they do like this amazing job like if you pulled that out and like kind of dirtied it up a little bit you could actually be convinced that these two individuals were uh you know from another from another century oh yeah for sure um but uh yeah so that that's kind of introduces the film and where where the film goes from there is obviously pretty pretty deep what did you think about the choice to go black and white the film is entirely in black and white front to back what was your uh good choice or bad don't think it would have been as good if it was in color i don't know that it would have it would be a, a whole different film yeah yeah i think it was the best i think it was one of the better choices of the uh of the cinematographer who was what Jared about, Blash, what about the uh the aspect ratio Oh, the uh, 35 millimeter. They're like literally boxed in. Yeah, it's so smart, right? Yeah, I'm so with you. I'm so so with you. Yeah, that like the the uh, 119. What is it? 119 one or 1916? Um, like where it's just it's literally pushed in so tight that like you you feel the um. You, I know it was shot on a 35. It was shot on 35 millimeter, which is like basically half of what the IMAX. Uh, theaters are shot or films are shot on um but which i think it's pretty much almost as big as you can get but like you you're totally right and it also makes it seem like you're it, once again it makes it seem like you're watching film from uh from the 1890s or looks like the a picture early 20s. yeah exactly it looks like a like almost like a disposable photo from like the early 20th century like it really and i do like what you're right it definitely does that thing where it kind of gives you a sense of of like um entrapment almost no that's a good touch yeah i thought that was really good um another inspiration for the film was uh edgar Allan poe's um unfinished story uh the lighthouse um which was it was also i mean that that poem or short story was like based on the same thing the the 19th century legend uh, so not too much different there um errol you got any theories let's let's dive into the to the good stuff here what's your theory on um 
And then what what is your take on some of the mythology? And like, first of all, I guess the, a good place to kind of transi- transition us into that is um, right before um, we do that. Then it would feel really disingenuous not to uh, mention the sound uh, production. The foghorn. Uh, so the foghorn and just um, a lot of the uh, music design. Uh, so the gentleman or one of the composers, uh, Mark Corvin, yeah, he made like this or he made it in. I don't think it was specifically for this movie, but it's called the Apprehension Engine. And it's just like a hurdy gurdy and like a bunch of like weird sounds just to make all like the horror movie and just like uneasy noises. And so, like, yeah, there's just stuff in this that's, you know, been done before, but like it's just weird to see them. Like, if you watch them experiment with the Apprehension Engine, it's a. Uh, you can really see how they made like the feel for it, and the hurdy gurdy is so appropriate for the time period too. So, oh, and, like, the uh, the uneasy uh, accordion or uh, what is it? The uh, uh, yeah, like the uneasy like accordion. Like it just sounds like a lazily played or like a poorly played accordion. Like it's really a sets the eerie, spooky mood. It's not a yeah. jaunty sea tune. You know what I'm saying? Well, I'll get to, I'll definitely dive a little bit into some of like um, the filmmaking inspiration side of things. Cause like, I definitely have a bunch to say on that, but I will tell you this and like, this is no, this will be no surprise to you. And there are a million moments in this film where you can draw um, a straight line from one to the other. But like, I mean, the music was a great place to, to start here because I can see so much of the shining in this film. And the music is exactly that. Like, just the ominous, drony sounds of the music. Uh, it, I mean, it is... A, it, I guess this. we'll just dive right into it, Errol. I mean, is this a fucking yeah, horror I'll movie? Do- is it a horror film? Like, could you categorize it as such? So, I was on the fence, and for the longest time, or, like, while I was watching it, I was like, no, it isn't. It's a psychological thriller. The music sets the tone. It is a horror movie. Ex- it's a horror murder. movie. Ex murder and all. How is this? How <laughs> yeah. is it that good? How is this that good of a movie where the guy literally pulls a head out of a uh, out of a out of a lobster, lobster trap. trap, and then the next scene is him like jumping and drinking merrily with the with the supposed and, killer. And we're not like this is a horror movie. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Exactly. But just a severed disembodied head that is it's fresh, man. There's the eye. Other eye is still in there. It's been like a week. Yeah, like he killed that. He killed that man. But yeah, but here's what. So this is, and okay. So we're gonna get into some of the theories because the head that he finds also looks like Eve from Winslow's head, right? I mean, it's unconfirmed, but it looks like the. It, so you see, there's a scene at the end, and listeners, I'm just gonna forewarn you, we're gonna jump all over this plot because there's just so much in this film, and we have to take it organically because if we try to stay chronological, it's just going to be impossible to stay on a, on a linear path. So we're just going to jump all over the place. Um, I, I strongly recommend viewing the film a couple of times before diving into what we have to say about it. Cause Earl and I have um, some theories and we've also seen the film a bunch of times too. So like we, it's a little bit easier for us to kind of move around the plot and we're going to do that. But like there is a scene at the end circling back to what I was saying where um Thomas Howard's character, uh, Robert Pattinson, who is now revealed to me, he spilled his beans about mm-hmm. about the about the uh, watching his employer die, his his boss. His, it was his previous boss, I believe, um, when he was working in a lumber uh, lumber yard, or a, he was a lumberjack, and oh, yeah. and he he sees him across when he sees himself. Like he looks over and like the hallucinations are still taking place, and um, it's the same face as the head in the lobster trap. Am I wrong? No, no, it's definitely not. There's the so Ephraim Winslow is like the blonde haired, like he looks the mustache, the blonde mustache guy, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh Ephraim Winslow, like he he looks like a definite other person. It's a little bit harder. So the lobster track head is a different person. It's I figured it was because the the eyeless thing, and also it looks like that seagull, which would confirm that you know, a um, little bit, yeah, true. Tom wasn't selling pork pies with the uh with the souls of dead sailors. Yeah. So and and he right and the missing eye is the dead giveaway. I just thought that there was like a small resemblance, but once again, I, I, there's so much in the film, um, it, it's 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 very possible. So, um, I mean, what did you think about the the? Uh, well, I got I want to I gotta know like how do you feel about like um, is this a testament to the writing, or is like, you know, obviously, obviously we've already discussed that Eagers is 
you know, hellbent on being like accurate period piece. Like he is, he will no stone unturned. Like the, the dialogue's got to be right. The clothing's got to be right. The shots got to be right. Everything's got to look like the time period. So you buy in, but like this dialogue is so well written. I it's, what is this a uh, transatlantic um, nautical talk? Like I, I, it's, I, there is definitely some like, um, you know, there's some sailor dialogue that's specifically Thomas Wakes, but um, Pattinson's character is a little bit more Americanized and New England y. Oh, yeah. I got like a little bit of Boston when he starts. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. It's purely New England, but like he yeah. still has a little bit of that transatlantic. The dialogue is still accurate for the period. Um, but Wake's older. So, like, he's older by probably 30 years or so, or it's perceived to be about 30 year age gap. So like his, his nautical, like, um, I, I don't know how the exact word to describe his, his language, but it's, it's the it's cut of his him, jib. The cut of his jib is a good way to put it. It's very like, um, I mean, it's fucking beautiful. I don't know. Like I, 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 I really love the way that it's communicated and the way it's written. Like I, I, I could listen to it all day. I just, I want more of it. I wish they would write a book. I wish they would write like a full book of this type of dialogue because um, it reminds me of a little Moby bit of Dick. like, what yeah, I guess you could. Yeah, I guess that's yeah, true. Moby Dick. I mean, yeah, well, I mean, Moby Dick is a different story. I just mean this story it would, if this story continue like the back and forths uh, between the two, um, if I got more of that. But no, you're right. The Moby Dick's a great example of that um, of that dialogue, that like nautical um, dialogue. Um, and I, I just love a movie like that because. Um, that's, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to do a little bit of my, my own theorizing here. It's not so much a theory. I think it's pretty, pretty clear. I've got three very, very obvious inspirations film wise, um, in terms of where I think eager drew some big time inspiration, all three of these specifically Kubrick. Um, we already discussed that, like, there's a lot of the shining in this film, um, between the music and the act scene and, the uh, madness like the going mad in a isolated place like the survival the survivalism aspect of the film very much the shining right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. next i have 2001 a space odyssey okay okay where i see i'm sorry go ahead say you lost me i lost you in 2001 i don't know how 2001 a space odyssey there is um a scene the scene at the end when the door opens, when that little glass door opens in to, oh, for him to see the light, yeah, that's that to me is the the um, the um, and like uh, as the as the music grows or as the the droning, right? Yeah, that that's this that's I mean that happens three or four different times in two thousand one, a space odyssey, specifically when any character in two thousand uh, in two thousand one. Is is interacting with the black object? The, uh, the, the there's like the uh, what is it called? I'm sorry, I'm I'm blanking on what what the black uh, the monolith. The monolith. Thank you. I'm sorry. The black monolith. It, it, it's like very emblematic of that, where it's just mesmerizing, and you don't really well, you don't see what he sees in the light. It's a uh, you know what they both are. Uh, in they're both uh, uh, Greek mythology. They're both a uh, or, or an orphic egg they're the cosmic egg oh they okay are, okay they're this the predecessors to come in and help here yeah they're the predis they're the predecessors to change oh so, right well well i knew that about the monolithic aspect of things like they like especially in 2001 where every time it appears there's an advancement in human evolution like the introduction of weapons to chimpanzees and then the um the uh colonizing of another planet and then eventually um interdimensional space travel and in, in the third example in 2001 um but there's like a um there's like a hominini aspect of it too between um species right like between the two species like like you have like the chimps and then the evolution to man and then the evolution to like interdimensional time traveling. Well, the, the yeah, it's the uh, evolution of chimps, evolution of man. Then there's the would be gap between evolution of man and the power struggle between artificial intelligence. Yeah, so it's like because right. that's what going to be to the next film, right? Yeah, well, that's like who would be the uh, who is the person to carry the Promethean flame 
who is right. the person is it going to be artificial intelligence is is uh is Hal going to kill him right then and there and just be you know done with it or does man prevail as he's yeah, done it's it's a clear power struggle and like um uh, well uh, we won't do, i mean we can't we, we can't go too far into 2001 but, and and i i i will we'll, we'll reserve a lot of that for another conversation but the prometheus aspect uh the prometheus aspect is found in this film errol i'm gonna let you take that away like introduce prometheus as a greek as an ancient greek god into the lighthouse okay yeah no absolutely so prometheus was uh the greek god he was a fire uh, yes he was one of the uh, gods of fire he was a, a well, he was a titan as well the supreme trickster uh so what he what he did is and here's the thing when i first watched the lighthouse whew, right over my head didn't even didn't even the even the promethean pose at the end with him getting his liver picked out by right yep. well like that the, one slipped by me too because what i kept seeing was because like film nerd over here like i absolutely all i saw was hitchcock like mm-hmm. the birds the film the birds by hitchcock like i saw and by the way there is a lot of hitchcock in this film but like you're right the promethean um like uh the fate in which he in which he meets uh, by the way though that fate is predicted by thomas wake um he he exclaims to him, him yeah he exclaims to him the Prome- the prometheus um the promethean uh end to his his he as, like, he's getting, he as he's getting subjects buried. him to the yeah he subjects him to the to the wrath of poseidon so here's the thing he curses both he curses both um ephraim winslow and he curses and thomas howard and thomas howard right he does yeah. uh so uh another another thing that almost slipped by me uh like five minutes before we started this so he was uh he he pretty much just uh took the gift of uh fire and gave it to mortals which is seen as knowledge um and that's definitely what the light is here it's just if you ask me it's knowledge it's power it's promise it's um it's it's might be false hope if you ask me it might just yeah right because there is a survivalist aspect no so what it is i i believe it's pandora's box I think the light is category. I think the light can be categorized as Pandora. So truly, really, he actually refers to it as uh, Pandora. I believe it's referred to in in the script at one point. Um, so here's here's the reason why I think that is because uh, um, as punishment, uh, Zeus created a woman, Pandora, sent down uh, to uh, uh, what's his name, at. Uh, uh, Ep- Ep- Epimetheus, yeah, Epimetheus. Uh, and then Prometheus is like, no, nah, don't mess with her. And then Epimetheus, Prometheus's brother, married her, and then she opened the lid that had all the horrors and evils and disease and hard work. So honestly, I kind of think when he saw that, he just saw all the horrors, even. It was like, that's why he was re- repulsed by it, literally repulsed from it. Yeah, because but what it, is that? But I, I feel like it's, I feel like it, um, the light represented like, a more hedonistic um philosophy because like there's obviously all i mean hedonism is like strewn throughout the film in like some but it's obviously it's like conjure or um it's like contradicted by a lot of like the tortures of like some like and i hate i hate to use this word because it's been a bit bastardized by like political um you know the political aspect of the world now but like it's contradict the hedonistic aspect is contradicted with like the toxic the the, the torture of toxic masculinity throughout the film and yeah, i don't mean that just in, like, a, a socially political re- correct way i mean like actual toxic masculine traits that are like um self-afflicting and mm-hmm. like the light it, the light itself within the light um and obviously there's a lot of symbolism with the light but i i view it as like because there's obviously scenes throughout the film where thomas uh where wake is up and he's viewed from afar in the light and he's like pleasuring himself like there's something like sexual he's going basking on. in it yeah yeah but why is it sexual? Because like that's that's what I because it's because it's your theory of knowledge is interesting, but it's not it's well because not sensually uh, self indulgent. So more... so knowledge knowledge is power, and uh, uh, it's just uh, it's relief, it's relief of having that knowledge. And here's the thing too. Uh, so uh, one of the more well known uh, ties is uh, is uh, 
uh, Thomas uh, or old being a Proteus, uh, one of the uh, gods. Oh, of the Proteus, sea. yeah. Yeah, Proteus. Proteus and yeah. he. The old man he, of the sea, that represents, that, that's Thomas, right? Uh, like the, the first Thomas. Yes, that's uh, the main jump for uh, for him or the main like uh, parallel. Uh, mm-hmm. He he is uh, he knows past, present, and future. He's able to look into the sea, so he's able to see beyond you know, see beyond sight, like old He Man. Uh, with that, um, he doesn't necessarily like gifting that knowledge to to anyone. Right. So, uh, right. And they treat, but here's, this is where like the sensu, the, the sensuality of like the, the light, I'm going to continue to uh, like, not, not push back. I'm actually trying to like, I'm trying to spin your wheel a little bit. I'm like greasing yours while, while spinning mine is like, there's also like, um, cause I want to, I want to, I want to almost, um, match up your, um, Greek philosophy with the Freudian Jungian, um uh psychological aspects of it and there's definitely like a uh there's a coveting of the light where their relation where it's treated almost as like a um as a spouse by yes. wake he's he's treating it like a spouse whereas like their dialogue as to, as to one to one another is like st- like you're not allowed to touch that like because because he's getting sexual pleasure from the light or whatever the light is supplying him or providing him like he's doing everything he can to fend off this younger ver- this like younger more studly version of himself well that um, too and their and their dynamic is very much like uh father uh, son yeah he's like a stepchild to right. um to the light big cuz he like you said he refers to the light as a as a woman mm-hmm. but Honestly, yeah. I don't. I don't think. Like I said, I believe that that light is the Orphic egg slash Pandora's box. It is the like object of change and eggs. Eggs historically, or not historically, but uh, like eggs have always been um, like androgynous. They've always been uh, like unisex because uh, it will is tra- change. It's a transformation. So, uh, but with him with him identifying that egg as a female, he sets that power uh, dynamic where he's like, she is for me. You listen to what I say and you like it, which sounds a lot like, you know, like a child dynamic. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. There's like, there's like a, like a a protectiveness or, uh, you know, a, he's putting a, like a, almost like a shell or a shield around it. Um, which is as as Eagers actually was quoted as saying, the Proteus figure that is more clearly nautical is somewhat based on the sea monster of Durer, who carries a tortoise shell shield. So this is this is this plays right into it. And there's a little bit of like he also indicates that it's uh, based on some like Melville philosophy, who is who, who obviously he wrote Moby Dick. So like there's obviously that has to be a part of the um, the writing here because just because of how of the of a the period and b how the dialogue was written and how it, it embodies the uh, nautical seamen speak um yes so there's plenty of that there's also um i was curious are you familiar with anything i i know everyone's heard of lovecraft but like have you yeah. read any hp lovecraft specifically that would that you could um connect the film to um so the only the closest one would definitely be the uh, mythos of like cthulhu uh, just because like the tentacles um there's oh, right. like a yeah. th- yep. so there's like loose uh what is it like dagon if i'm not yeah loose dagon cult oh the stuff, Dag- but, yeah the daganism the cultist stuff is definitely in here yeah i think it's like a loosely based but um i don't think there is a like a ex- i don't think there's like a direct tie um while he does seem kind of like culty with like the way he uh like handles the stuff like where he's like very secretive like he has a secret knowledge mm-hmm. um i don't i don't think it, it has as much as a lovecrafting because here's the thing in lovecraft like the uh well so it's also about like madness too a lot of hp lovecraft stuff but there's not a lot of uh like cosmic horror there's not a lot of like existential it's very either yeah he doesn't he doesn't yeah. play so much with the supernatural unless you would unless you would 
unless it science would, fiction to you is like it can, would fall in that camp which it wouldn't for me necessarily because science fiction is kind of entrenched in somewhat nonfiction or like yes anticipation of what could be nonfiction in the future um mm-hmm. but yeah lovecraft didn't really play with stuff like that that is like fantastical and- and a lot of the stuff that was scary for him was like horrors beyond your comprehension. Like it wasn't like a, it wasn't necessarily like, Oh, there's scary big stuff in the ocean. It's there's something old enough in the ocean that like used to be like the ruler of the land. And it's, he's so powerful that if you look at him, you're going to go crazy, yeah. which is like, you know, there's not really a lot of, well, I mean the, the light itself is kind of Lovecraftian where, right. It has this power over everything and rules over the sea. Well, also he's like he the like the I actually would think I actually would say that your theory on like his protection of the light and they're having like them having like a father son relationship or father stepson relationship where like he's coveting over thy mother if the light re- would represent like the um the the sensual source for Thomas Wake's character and then the younger. Uh, Thomas uh, Howard slash um, Ethan Winslow's character, there is like he do, he kind of taps into some like, and because he's playing with sexuality in the writing for Thor, right? Like there's a lot of like there's a lot of movement in the sexuality thing. There's like um, there's, there's a, a whole of, vagina on the screen, a mermaid vagina, right? And what's weird is like there were theories that like uh, there were people were theorizing that the two characters were homosexual. Um, I would argue that that's kind of disproven because like he's um, I don't think he is. Um, I mean, he could be, there's like almost bisexuality there. I think there's like an Oedipal, there's an Oedipus. It's, it's referred to in Wikipedia as an Oedipal fixation. I think that's right. I think that there's like a coveting, the coveting of the light because uh, wake is treating the light as the mother figure of all knowledge of all, of all power. And he's like, He's seeking it because of like whatever it is, the toxic masculinity, the pent up sexual. Well, also, situation. so here's yeah. the thing: it becomes the the lay itself becomes an egregore, which is right, um, right, true. Another, it's another Greek term. So even before, uh, yeah. even before uh, uh, Thomas uh, Wilson was there, he uh, the other light tender, the other wiki was like. That thing's that thing's literally salvation. That thing is heaven. Like a, yeah, he became he became quote mad over it. He thought that the yeah he thought it was and he dude, refers that, to it specifically as salvation. And it's so hilarious when he's saying that scene because all the stuff is happening to uh to uh, uh sorry to Thomas to too Winslow. young yeah. So while he's experiencing that, he's uh. Like he's like, all right. I just saw the mermaid. I heard the calls. I really want to see this light. And he's like, yeah. The last guy here went crazy. He said he heard mermaids. And then also, uh, he wanted the light. So like, you better, pff, you're crazy. Well, well, he also like, I was, I was noticing, um, in my my very last viewing of the film, um, I remember the first time I was seeing it. I remember the the first time that I heard him do something where I was like, oh, he's like actually trying to make him go mad. Was pretty late in the film where like he destroys the dory at the end. And he was because he just so he comes out with the axe. You don't leave me. Which, by the way, there's like a that scene in and of itself is like a bit like um, they have like a relationship. Clearly, there's like a psycho. You yeah. can make a psychoanalysis about the relationship and it being potentially sexual. Like, please don't leave me. Like, if you leave me, I'll kill you. Like, type of like a toxic yes. relationship. Um, but he kill he destroys the dory, the life, the uh, the rescue boat, the wooden rescue rowboat that could get them once the seas calm. Yeah, and, like, and then he walks in. That, hmm. well, the, I'm sorry, go ahead, stay on that. Yeah, no, what, what, while, what he's, while he's while uh, he's doing that, he's wearing the life vest that's just wood. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, you're talking about like, uh, t- Winslow. Yeah, it's just so yeah. it's time period accurate, it's and so um, yeah. seems like it's practical, basically but shims. Also, it's wooden shims, just like lined yeah. by by some by some fabric. So it's a it's a callback to both um, when he was like you know a lumberman. He's like you know I got it. This will help me or what? You know what I mean? It's just like Ooh, right, this yeah. was like a part of him, and he's like going back to his roots. He's like you know I'm I'm not a I'm not Ephraim Winslow man. I got to get out of here. I was a lumberman. I got to I'm you know I don't want anything to do with a lighthouse. I'm leaving. And then that, also, at that point he had spilled his beans too. So his yes. his because this movie obviously also plays with identity. 
And mm-hmm. so like he he abandons his identity to come to the lighthouse. But then when he spills his beans, he starts refer, re- reverting fully, back to his fully identity. surrounds him fully surrounds himself in the trees, like he was he, used to. Exactly right. And then That's so exactly. on top of that, from uh, the Promethean aspect of it, he knew he was going to have to deal with water. So water tree is good for um, on top of well, other bolts than flotation. Um. Other than flotation and uh, let's say like knowledge, like writing down pieces of like you know making paper. Um, oh right, okay. Fire. Oh right. He wanted a, He needed a barrier. Aspect. Yeah, he had a. He wanted a barrier. Like so, worst case scenario, you'd be able to like you know light a fire barrier between you and the water, so it's not like a direct. But that's like you know that's like maybe a little too much of a stretch. Yeah, um, you might be you might be reaching a little bit, but I like. But I here's. Like I like Here's less of a reach, though, with uh, with the uh, parallels between uh, Proteus and Prometheus. Proteus, uh, he's uh, associated with water. With water, his favorite thing uh, to do, his favorite pastime, is to drink. Oh, beautiful! Ephraim, Ephraim yes. Winslow, his favorite is... pastime is to smoke. Oh, right. So there's drinking. He's always drinking smoking. and smoking. More elemental. Yes, yes, I see. I see so when he, I see. when so he, you see when contrast, they, and then you see you see the, where the two where the two characters kind of uh, are dissolving into the Greek mythology. Exactly when they fir- when they first meet, he's like, "Here's a shot. Share this drink with me." Ephraim's he looking. For, yes, he's he looking. He, he need he needs to stay clear. He's looking for the fire. He needs to keep a level head. He doesn't want. He tells him he's like, "Oh, the sailors they used to do that so he could keep them drunk." And he's like, "Oh, like he's like, oh, I guess you got us." You know what I mean? But that's like, yeah. uh, here's the, uh, Proteus knows everything. He doesn't need to know anything else. It's better to just dull his, you know, sometimes the curse of knowledge is, you know, too much. You just like, you'd want to drink and dull yourself. So he's right. trying to dull Prometheus. Prometheus right. would simply like to, you know, partake in the flame and you'll know. Right. And, so then, and then the character and then Prometheus, the Prometheus being Winslow, like de- he like almost devolves as he starts indulging in the drink. Yes, and here's the thing too. He, um, he devolves into madness. They 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 both they both drink and they both smoke. They just one prefers the other. The other prefers the other. Um, and they make that what, clear. They make that very clear yeah. at the beginning. But um, but uh, old but old has a pipe, and whenever they partake, whenever they share the flame, they are sharing knowledge they're talking to each other they're sharing that whenever they're sharing the the uh uh the alcohol they're sharing the ignorance they're just like drowning in the sorrow so look and you'll you'll notice if you watch it again whenever he's like hey like you know light my light my pipe and they share the, they're they're formidable they're friends and that's also yeah. kind of messed up with the dynamic because well, uh, he says to him, he says there's actually a line that can support this too. Um, this is why this is conversation is so like enlightening because when you bring the Greek, Greek mythology aspect into all this, he actually, he actually says to him, you're only tolerable when you're drunk or when you're drinking one of the two, either drinking or drunk, which, mm-hmm. indi- which is a pure indication that like that th- they have when they they're breaking bread or on common ground when sharing in each other's vices or in this yes. case, not their vices, but they're like their lifeblood. That's when they're having the best time, but also that power dynamic doesn't work because you can't be the boss and then be a friend. It's either one or the other. But uh, but old would like to have his cake and eat it too. And Ephraim is it makes him nihilist, him nihilistic. It, yeah, and there's something him nefari- resent him. There's something nefarious about um, about uh, Wake's character too because I think he's planting seeds of of, of madness um, throughout the film, especially at the like. He actually does it like two or three times early in the film that I had. See, so here's before. the thing. I, I think I think Wake was not crazy. But here's the thing. Here's the crazy thing, too. Got to go right back to the Proteus thing. There's a couple times in the movie and from all of the uh, all of the film breakdowns and stuff that I've seen, like they're like, oh, Proteus is known to change his shape. He's a shapeshifter. And you kind of see that in the film where he will change Tentacles. his shape to yep the tentacles when he kind of looks like where he like has like the uh like the coral on him and then changes into uh ephraim and then look at oh and also you could argue when he was on top of the lighthouse when he looks at him and it's uh and thomas sees himself when young sees himself you could say that that was also him shape-shifting but i think the more important uh meaning of that is uh 
he he changes and he shapes and he forms the truth to how he feels it should be what he says is law like that's um uh, changeable in shape or form i think he utiliz- utilizes that just to like what is going on right. um that's how he twists the words and he doesn't i don't think he he like doesn't care about that it's his words law because he is the boss anyways and his power is to manipulate the truth and that's what he does in the log books that's what he does to uh to young and that's what he has done his whole life because it's literally his it's what he is Right. Well, he definitely does that, especially uh, in the scene where he he destroys the dory and then and then indicates. It. Well, he is also playing with time a lot too. Like he's he's like, he's like we've been here for weeks. Time. He's been it's been two days, right? See, like, but how do you, how do you know that uh, he's not that lying? Well, when you're especially what? when you're mad, when you've already when you're already in a state of madness, and the and what you and you're in also in hallucinogenics, like a, a hallucinogenic state where they are drinking turpentine and honey. And honey, yeah, that yeah, time. that's bad. So sipping down kerosene and shit, like it's. I it's tried to, bad. I tried to break that down, and I think I might have got like, dude. All right, so turpentine when you drink it, yeah, you technically will get drunk because it's like you know ethanol, but it will it will blind you. Mm-hmm. It'll it'll you know make you it will blind you, it'll make you ignorant. Uh, honey is sweet. Uh, so when they're drinking the turpentine and the honey mixed together, like they're they're just indulging in sweet ignorance. Mm. Like they don't care about like you know the job that they need to do. They're just like we are just going to like go full bore and just like full on into the uh, off the deep end, almost literally. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's nice, right? Yeah, I mean the. The aspects of the film that are um, well, let's get into like some of like the sexuality stuff because there's like obviously so you have you have like the homoeroticism that could be um, you could dive into that based on like the the quote unquote phallic imagery of the lighthouse, um, and I, I think that's pretty intentional because there's like sexual fantasies and masturbation throughout the film and there is clearly like a, almost a sexual tension between the two characters. The, at one point they actually almost like literally oh, so, kiss. So, so here's the thing um, that does like come to a head um, and think about it. Uh, a sexual act or a physical fight is either way physical. They get right. to a point and that's, you could almost say it's part of the toxic masculinity. They right. get to a point where they are comfortable in, they're slow dancing, they're slow dancing, with each other, almost about um, to kiss. And then they, they look at each fight. They look at each other and they care about each other in that moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and the one yeah. thing that, um, uh, that you could argue is uh, that would have saved them the whole time is human connection, but they didn't care about the connection. They just cared about the light and like and what it possibly would have meant. Yes, right. exactly. So when they both find themselves at that point of weakness, they still, they they're still so worked up that they need to get physical, but they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna kiss, they're not gonna touch each other because that's that's gay, and they're you know they're right. rough and tough sailors. So what do you do when you get? What's the other way to get physical? You gotta you start, start fighting, you know. Yeah. So that's why when he put up his hands, he's like, yeah, and then he gave him like, the old fucking dirty was, dog. Yeah, he gave him the old what, fucking dirty dog. He didn't look at him. He, <laughs> like they both look at each other. They like look like they're gonna kiss, and then when he like put his hands up, he's like, he, that's that's the nicest they let, they smile at each other. And oh he wasn't, yeah, like, they're they're, he they're happy to do it. Yeah, he wasn't like, oh, we have to fight because like, oh, that he's like, yeah, like that's a really good idea. Like that's you know we gotta we're gonna really like work it out. So you know they trade blows. Uh, however you want to you know take yeah. that well it's also like the there's 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 like all well, the power struggle is there too because it's like um there's like a as, there's an aspect of that like the failed sexuality between the two characters like um and then resulting in like an actual fisticuffs like there's a there's a dynamic there where after that because you just see this too where like um, and I, I want to dive into another scene here in a second, but like you see, like uh, the power struggle, it does shift. So, like obviously, you have the Prometheus Proteus uh, relationship, and one in, one in which is prophecy telling, and the other is which, um, like knowing all, right? And there is there's they switch though. There's moments in the film where they switch, where that power, um, that power, maybe not switch. It switches the wrong word. It's almost who is in a, in an advantageous state. Well, no, the, the power the dynamic absolutely. The power dynamic absolutely switches, and um, 
you notice like once it switches, the one thing that uh, that Thomas Wilson has been sick of his whole life is just being referred to as a dog, um, which is, is Thomas, kind of is it Wilson or Howard? I thought it was Thomas Howard. Oh yeah, sorry, Tom Thomas Howard. Ephraim. Ephraim okay, sorry, yeah, Ephraim, no, no, Ephraim yeah, Wilson, I got Thomas it. Howard. Yep, yeah, Thomas Howard. Um, yeah. Just do Winslow. Winslow's easier. Yeah. So. I'm just gonna do old and young. Uh, yeah, so it's <laughs> it's yeah, and that's that's cool how it's time. written, and that's how it's written in the uh, script. Okay, cool, perfect. So, uh, was it Prometheus? Uh, God, God dang it, was this in um, the shifting of the power dynamic? Yes. So where that happens? So the whole the his whole life he's been called a dog, and he doesn't see himself as a dog. But they're almost right because a, a dog is man's best friend, and you could argue out of all the titans that Prometheus is man's best friend. Um, but the thing is, the way he like acts, like he's he's not physically a dog. He really isn't. He doesn't like to do the work that he's being told to do. He would like to like you no, know he's rebellious. be the best person he can. Yeah, he's just and, and dogs are like they're lap dogs. They do whatever you say. Like he's not so he's not like technically a dog. Like as Prometheus though, he is the dog. No, you get that's part of the building of the power dynamic the or the, not the not the power dynamic itself, but the struggle between the two powers. Like yeah, you you, and, you see that struggle starting to to boil because I you start the resentment of his of his like um inferiority to uh to Thomas um uh to uh, Tom, to Wake's character to Willem Dafoe's character like mm-hmm. you start to see that he's he's resenting and he's resentful and bitter of the of the you know the lashing out that he's getting um and the obviously being on the wrong end of that power and being forced to do you know, basically, basically slave labor. And obviously that shifts after they throw the fisticuffs at the end of the film. And, and there's the scene at the end where he, he, he literally walks him out of the building as dog treat tolls, tells him to, to bark like a dog. And then well, puts it's, him on a leash it, and walks it's the wor- It's the worst thing he can think of. It's the, exactly. Be because it's the worst it's, thing that it's the worst thing that happened to him is to be treated like a dog. So he literally inverses it and inflicts it upon his uh, the Proteus character um, in Thomas Wake, um, and then buries him alive. Which there's got to be symbolism there. I don't. I, I didn't really dive into that. Um, I well, so out what I what I uh, liked about that the alive aspect. If it if if we go by the um, if we go by the uh, Greek mythology of it, uh, Proteus is a god of the sea. He was getting weaker and weaker as they threw the dirt on him. Like he was like he he he. It was just almost got, like it killed him. Yeah, he got dragged in. He didn't, you know. Maybe he got oh, punched more a play bit. of more elemental he, play, right? Earth, he, Earth yeah, is he, what Earth is what like subjugates him to death. He oh yeah, and it is death. It is like final as you get buried. But, but he doesn't like, die. He doesn't actually no, die. It just weakens him. As, to, yeah, but to like escape. as he. As he's getting uh, buried, he gets like weaker and weaker and weaker. It's as if like his connection, as his connection to the sea was getting severed, like his power right. was oh, getting perfect. severed. Yeah, right. Yeah. And then he remembered, like you know, the light. So that was like his last kind of like uh, his swan song, the only thing he can do. Uh, but uh, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of meaning in just the names themselves. So Thomas is wake, uh, wake. First of all, wake is obviously a play yeah. on like on oceanic, on uh, oceanic waves and tide and all that. Oh yeah, and uh, um, there's there's also more to it. Uh, for just the last name Wake. What about Ephraim? What's Ephraim? What's e- that? Ephraim is a, mean. it's a uh, biblical, but Wake also means a uh, man of the watch. Oh, perfect. He's, yeah, he's, he's the keeper. Yep. And, uh, and Ephraim, he, it was a biblical, uh, he, uh, what did he, what did he do? I believe he, uh, he was the son of Jacob, if I'm not mistaken. And he led tribes to freedom. His name was, or it was, uh, equatable. The name's equatable to fruitful. Uh, Winslow is translated to friends hill or friends burial mound so ephraim winslow is well no ephraim winslow is the guy that got uh yeah ephraim ephraim winslow uh would translate to a fruitful burial mound so with with his old boss getting swallowed up by the logs uh young got a 
like Ephraim was a fruitful burial mound. Oh, okay. Yeah. You, no, you can play into that for sure. Yeah, it's called it, it translates like literally to like Friends Hill. But like yeah, so it was like the like the uh, or like bur- burrow would be a good one. So like uh fruitful fruitful friends burrow. He uh he was a friend. He says, "Oh, he's just a boss, and he's always riding me." But it's probably the same thing. He was like just trying to be his friend and like helping him out. But he just let him die. But he was he got a he benefited from his death, so it was a fruitful death. Um, wake on top of being watch, uh, dude. Thomas, Thomas. This one almost slipped by me. Uh, Greek god of the sea. T h a u m a s. Another, another, yeah. I mean, these are all over there. Like, I mean, the the King Triton is involved, and Poseidon is is. He, I believe uh, Neptune is referred to. Like, that's the curse, right? The curse was was Neptune. yeah. He, no, uh, the curse he, of the, Poseidon. Well, it was, it was the curse of Poseidon, but the power of Neptune was cursed upon him. Yeah. Oh, she, like, um, and then there's like Amphor. Am- oh yeah, no, Am- he Am- goes yeah. Am- let, let yeah, no, you're right. He is like the let Neptune strike you dead. Park. Right. Yeah. Um. Yep. But uh, yeah, so if we go by the name uh, Thomas in like Greek mythology, his wife was Electra, who was one of the Oceanids, and uh, had a daughter, or had a couple daughters and sons uh, that that were like harpies and uh, like other things. One was uh, the messenger to the gods, Iris, and then another one was like a messenger too. But if you go by that, I would assume that when uh. Uh, when old mentions like he's like oh I was married to someone and we had some kids uh, but I never stayed 13 think, Christmases 13 Christmases yeah. like without you know that'll, it that'll do it she couldn't forgive me right. I think his wife was was Electra oh okay yeah well that would make that would tie in that would tie in Proteus right yeah and then yeah. that would make uh, uh, Ceto the sea yeah Okay. Cito was doo, 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 um a primordial sea goddess. So pretty much just like the sea. Um and they bore like monstrous children. But either way, it was the offspring of Gaia, offspring of the uh, earth. Uh this one is a little bit more of a stretch. I wanted to oh yeah, he, um I am I'm I am just gonna rip these off real quick. So all it. in all, I Let believe there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I think there's twelve characters shown in the whole movie. There might be more, there might be less, it might be crazy. Um so we'll start with the stuff that we already mentioned. Uh old is gonna be Protus or maybe Zeus. Uh young would be Prometheus. Uh the uh his old wife would be Electra. The uh, C would be a Cedo. You could also argue it's like Poseidon or Gaia. Uh, here is where it gets. Uh, here's the most speculation that I have, but I think it kind of checks out. The boat people, because there are two of them. One of them would have been Charn, and the reason I think is Charn is because Charn's job is just to uh, traverse like the river Styx and like stuff like that and just make sure that like people are good to go but his main job is just to not judge so it makes sense that just drop just, him and go yeah he's like i don't care what business you have or what you're doing get off the boat you know what i mean right. and then the other one was really hard i had to uh kind of struggle with it but i believe the uh second uh boat person is a uh, i believe it's a uh, pronounced like plutus And uh, he is the, yeah, or sorry, yeah, uh, yeah, Plutus. Uh, he is the god of e- abundance and wealth, and uh, Zeus made him blind. So when he was giving out the wealth or the provisions, his uh, symbol is a cornucopia, uh, he was supposed to give them out to people, whether they were good or bad, like just no matter what. He was supposed to also not judge people and just give them what they needed or like, you know, give them wealth or give them, you know, a bounty, which Charn brings them there. The dude gives them the bounty and then they dip. That's the biggest stretch that I have. 
uh, the seagulls, if we're going Greek mythology, would just be the souls of the damned, like everything else. And they kind of say, yeah, I mean, that's basically, it. but that's actually a hand, that's like spoon fed in the film. Yeah. Like, like he actually tells that he tells the folklore to you because uh, the killing of a sea of a seabird is obviously um, referred to as like a, a, a bad luck trope, um, which actually calls it actually does kind of tie in. It calls the storms upon them, um, which oh, prevents yeah. their rescue or prevent not their rescue because they're not in dire straits yet. They're they're awaiting the tender to pick them up, and it just doesn't happen because the storms are so bad. I thought this was an interesting tie, um, and not to deviate too far from the Greek mythology, but like um, I was reading, somebody had a somebody linked it to The Shining again. In that, uh, so in The Shining, obviously Jack Torrance indicates all work and no play makes a Jack makes Jack a dull boy. Whereas <laughs> in this film, in this film, it's quoted as saying, uh, "Wake" is quoted as saying, "Boredom makes men to villains," um, yeah. which is basically the exact same uh, thing. And actually, I think it's an interesting conversation. I, I think that's actually there's a lot of truth in that. There that that doesn't need to be shape shifted into truth. I think that's actually a very true statement. There's a lot to pull that apart. Um, it's a it's nihilism, right? It's like part. Yeah, exactly. It's a comment on nihilism, and it's a it's. It's um it it defines what happens to a man when he when he's when his purpose is removed um and uh, not it's not a pro capitalism comment in my opinion I don't think necessarily but it's um it's certainly an anti uh, nihilistic viewpoint or perspective oh, about yeah. the dangers of nihilism which are, in, are infinite basically um but uh, there's obviously a scene there's the scene that actually. Um, they basically re envision the hypnosis 1904 painting um, is actually a, is visually referenced in the film. They literally do it word for word. And he's like completely like uh, uh, Wake's character is completely nude, like shining the light through, from his eyes into the light of uh, he's like passing the he's passing the light through him into uh, um, uh, Ephraim's character. Mm-hmm. In, under the in a, in a rainstorm, no, no less. Um, whereas, like, a, I think the hypnosis painting actually takes place under water because they're um, oh, they're, appropriate. Yeah, so, like, the the rain was the next best thing for that. Um, let me just pull up our our script. Um, there's yeah. obviously okay. we've covered quite a bit, but I, I did want to I did want to point out um, some of the. There's a lot of Hitchcock in here too. Um, oh, I was gonna say I got, I still got a bunch of those. Uh... I still got like six more characters to go down. Jesus, wait, how, how? All right, well, let's uh, let's let's continue down that path. Why don't you why don't you fill us in? Keep, keep yeah, no, we're I said six, but we're almost done. Um, okay. Ephraim, Ephraim would be uh, uh, Prometheus's brother, Epimetheus. Uh, he was interpreted as the god as foresight, literally forethinker. If you ask me, foreman, the foreman. Okay, right. He actually refers to him as the foreman because he yep. was the foreman on the lumber on the lumber yard. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, so that checks out. While uh, Prometheus is characterized as ingenious and clever, Epimetheus is described as foolish. Um, I think he was foolish in thinking that like he would save him, and then kind of being like a with the name uh, friends friends hill fruitful friends hill. It kind of if you ask me, it ties it in together that uh he did like kind of consider him a friend, but he's like you know what like you're just a little too like mean to me, and I'm just yeah. gonna let you die. So he just let his like you know he let him die. Um, I will say as a side note, the thing about and this isn't to like I'm not trying to uh, derail you because I actually I think you're you're tying a lot of these in, and I, I bet you eagers would probably. Um, valid. I, I'd be curious to hear what he has to say about a lot of this stuff, and he probably has validated some of them. But it's interesting that, like, um, well, philosophical um, figures, specifically in, in this case, Greek philosophy um, and philosophical figures. The thing about philosophy is interesting because it, it does. You can make a film like this, and the philosophies can reach pretty much anywhere. Uh, like tentacles, not not to be uh, too you know trite, but. Um, <laughs> The, the because that's the beautiful part about philosophies is that they can be applied um, in so many different contexts and that's what makes a film like this when he entrenches the film in philosophy in one way or another it can it reaches all of the others um it acts as almost like a um a central like almost like a central uh command for all different well um, it's it's because a lot of these stories are based off of that they're all based off of how you feel and like, you know, right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's, well, that's just philosophy one-on-one. It's like a very, 
um, the, philo the, the philosophy is entrenched in the human experience and the mind. Play, right? Plays have always just been, or plays or movies or books or anything have just been made to make us feel some kind of way, to make us like think differently or like feel some kind of different viewpoint to uh, portray yeah. a different philosophy. Right, in in context in which we can relate. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to derail you, but continue. Oh yeah, no, we're almost done. Um, there's only a couple more. Um, so, a uh, quick recap then: uh, Proteus, old; Prometheus, young. Yep. Uh, C would be Cedo, I believe. Uh, Light, Pandora. Um, the boat people would be Charn and uh, uh, Plotus. Uh, seagulls would be the souls of the dam. The wife would be Electra. I believe us, the viewers, would be man because a lot of the secrets are yes, kept from us. Observer. Right. Yeah. And a lot of the stuff, information that is divulged is divulged through young or Prometheus. Like he, whatever he learns, we learn. So, That's true. Yeah. Because like it does seem to be that like, well, he's the keeper of, he's the, if he's the keeper of the lighthouse, he's the keeper of all knowledge. So like yes. you only get to, and if Prometheus and, is the visitor of 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 that in which is kept, he we have to learn through him and what he's what's unveiled to him. And um, in true uh true Greek mythology, uh, there you remember the scene where Ephraim's like, forget it, I'm gonna try to steal the key during his midday nap, and then he oh yeah, and, th and then when it. he gets upon him, he actually pulls the dagger out and begins to put it to his throat. Um, yeah, but then pulls away and. So, he actually does admit later that he he actually did see him with the knife. Oh yeah, he's like uh, you're. He's like you're not safe with you. Um, right. But uh, Protus in in mythology, he was uh, known of all things past, present, and future. But the, just like divulging information, and if you wanted uh, the information, you had to surprise him during his noonday slumber. Oh yes, because he so he's that's his shift. Right? Yeah. That so you had to sense. surprise and bind him during his noonday slumber. He he surprised him, but he didn't have him bind bound, or else he wouldn't right, have been able to. He would have divulged his secrets. But he's always in a noonday slumber because that's how the um, that's how the shifts the shift work was was. Why well, he's he's that's what confirmed to me that he's literally uh, Proteus. Yeah, no, you're right. You're definitely right. I wonder if Eager's actually. God, I would love to hear. I would love to hear it from the horse's mouth, but I believe they have like said that. I'll try to yeah, confirm I, it. I, there's a lot of interviews. He did a lot of like um, lower. He didn't do any super mainstream media. There's a lot of interviews, but I haven't. I haven't gotten through all of them. I'm, I'm definitely going to continue to to be, um, to watch them. You know, even after our recording tonight. But I okay. want to hear. I want to hear if these. If I want to. He doesn't like to, and he's a little bit hush hush about some of his inspirations in, in the writing process, um, because he wants the film, he wants the viewer to, he wants viewers like us to do this. Well, yeah, it's, it's supposed speculate. to be open ended. Um, he yeah. actually, yeah, it's subjective. They actually said, uh, well, it was uh, Robert Eagers himself. Let me get the quote. He said, um, "If we succeed in our efforts, the ambig ambiguity should uh, be keeping you engaged as an audience." And that's right. exactly what it's doing. Like, you know, this came out a while ago. We're still watching it. We're like, you know, um, the, oh, uh, this the, movie's going to age beautifully. Like the, 30 the years from now, it'll, it'll, it'll actually probably be viewed with more um, allure. Yeah, no, we can only hope he only deserves it. Yeah, it's true. But it, um, but yeah, um, two more that would I would say are the most reaches. Like I couldn't find anything on this, but it just it made sense to me, and um, it would be the last two characters that I would uh, categorize, uh, and it would be, uh, oh, also you could consider uh, Ephraim uh, Apollo because uh, Apollo was the uh, uh, he was revered, influential, blah blah blah. He was a uh, uh, he was the god of divine distance who sent or threatened from afar the god who made men aware of their own guilt or purified them of it. So he was uh, uh, Ephraim was constantly making uh, Thomas aware of his guilt where he would just pop up. Even in the beginning he was in the ocean with the logs um, oh, true, and yeah. then he would constantly pop up just being like hey like I am here like you know so I, I like to think it's loosely uh, I, I bounce between uh Epimetheus and Apollo, but uh, the tender, the second tender, the one-eyed, uh, the the seagull, I believe that was a uh, Polyphemus. Oh, the second, you mean the second wiki? 
Yeah, the second wiki. Yeah, the tender was the the tender was actually the the shippers who were supposed to be picking them up or supposed to pick up, um, uh, 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 Ephraim. Yeah, I believe the after his uh, weeks were up. Yeah, I believe the uh, uh, the second wiki was uh, Polyphemus, who was a Cyclops. Um. Oh, perfect! Because the missing eye. Yep. And uh, he, uh, the object of uh, Polyphemus' romantic desire was a sea nymph named uh, uh, Galata or Galatea. Um, and what was the main tie into why I thought it was? Because there's there's a good tie why it's him. Do to do. He was blinded during the uh, by Odysseus, and I believe he was also you know he was blinded by the lighthouse. Oh right! Oh right. right! 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 Yeah. So like so, too much knowledge, like the, the yes. overburden of knowledge, right? Okay. So yeah, I think like so he wasn't like physically blinded by the lighthouse, but he was like blinded in his, you know, uh, in his what he wanted to do by the uh, lighthouse, and then we get to his uh, his love, um, you know, his love interest, which really ties it together for me. Galita was a. Uh, uh, what was she? Where is it? Uh, give me a second. I'm scrolling down. Um, King uh, Pygmalion is uh, is made into a... Wait, sorry. There's a king who uh, was a sculptor, and he fell in love with a marble statue he crafted with his own hands. And uh, through prayers, the goddess Aphrodite brought it to life. Oh, and it was, uh, okay. It yeah, was yeah, in, yeah. It was in, or, so there's marble, and then there's also like an ivory statue, like depiction of it. Oh, it's perfect. So, like, like the, yeah, uh, like the fetish. Yeah, Similar it's the, to the fetish. Yeah, exactly. It's the fetish. It's the, uh, what is it? It's the scrimshaw. So the scrimshaw was. Yeah, oh, that's what he know, calls it. That's the actual terminology for it. Yeah, the scrimshaw yeah. The mermaid. Yeah. Yep. So that scrimshaw was brought to life. And then also the last guy was like in love with her too. And um, so, yeah, that is like he like saw her and that's yeah, that would be a Galita. Wow. OK. Yeah. No, you've 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 done a pretty nice job of like actually tying. The, this seems to be like the inspiration for a lot of the character development um, in the writing. Um, Dude, no, as I, think, I, I, think, across this stuff, I don't think you're wrong. I don't think you're like, I think I as, would be curious to hear him verify this, but it's it's not much. It's not too much of a stress. Some of it, I would say. To say that you're a hunt, that each character you've attributed is like on the money, but I think you're I think you're at least close. You're in the wheelhouse where like probably most of what you're saying, most of your connections are, are being drawn are like not not landish at all. Dude, as I was doing the research, I was like, it's either a coincidence or he is absolutely insane. I was like, no, this is insane. ridiculous. I was like, I think this is insane. ridiculous, and because it, it's just some of the stuff is just too much to like bad eye at. Yeah, no, he's 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 um. I mean, he's like the, he's he's known for being like completely obsessive about research. So I, I I wouldn't doubt it. This this guy has a he has a chance to kind of pivot into like our generation's Kubrick if he's if he's oh. smart about his his you know movie selections and and film development process. Um, on, yeah, on, no, on this I've, note, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say I just I said the names like 16 times, but I just wanted to categorize them all real quick and just like one place. Um, right before we segue into the next one, um, we're looking at old Proteus, young Prometheus, Ephraim, Epimetheus, or Apollo. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, second wiki would be uh, Polyphemus. The mermaid would be uh, Galatia. The sea, Cedo, or Gaia, or Poseidon. Um, light, Pandora. The boat people would be Charon and uh, Plutus. The yep. uh, old wife, Electra, his daughters would be uh, Oceanids or Harpies, stuff like that. Uh, and then the seagulls are the souls of the damned, and then that leaves us as man. Perfect. Okay, nice. Nailed it. I, I, I just think that there's there, it would just be too much of a coincidence if it wasn't intentional to... Because the character, the attributable um, characteristics that you, could, that you can draw to, I mean, it's it's you're probably pretty close if if not on the money so um that's great let's let's do a quick uh we're going to do a quick break let you guys digest that for just a few minutes digest errol's uh research on greek mythology in relation to the lighthouse i mean um the film is just soaking in it and i mean that uh pun intended um 
but for that for that sake, let's just take a short break. Um, do a quick, um, you know, bask in that for a few minutes, um, and we will be right back to uh, continue on the film. We've got a few. I've got a few more things I want to touch on, and then um, we'll wrap it up, take one more break, and we'll we'll do a rating and review and a little bit of summarization of our like opinions more generally on the film. So hang tight. We'll be right back in just a few moments. Okay, welcome back to the Peripheral Reviews Podcast. We're talking The Lighthouse, uh, Robert Eager's 2019 psychological thriller, if we could call it that. It's got a lot more to it than just that. Um, Errol did a great job dissecting some of the uh, some of the connections to Greek mythology and the characters of Greek mythology and how they relate to the, to the characters um, in the film. Um, I mean, it's entrenched in that kind of stuff. It's entrenched in psychology. Um, specifically Freudian and Jungian psychology. Um, it has cool. aspects of paganism, puritism, uh, daganism, homoeroticism. Um, there's inspiration from Kubrick, inspiration from Hitchcock, um, folklore. I mean, it's got everything you want in a film with just basically relying and, and almost entirely relying on two unbelievable acting performances from Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson, without a doubt. Oh yeah. Um yeah, speaking of like all those references like the paganism and everything, um the the little uh the little reference to it uh uh Thomas uh, or old he says at one point he's like uh, I dated a girl in Salem in the 19th century. In Salem, I dated yeah. a girl in Salem during the witch trials. That's crazy. Well, that's why I thought I actually thought that was a homage that he was he was reaching back to his previous film The Witch. Um, cause it, which also takes place actually it does not take place in the same time period. I think the witch takes place like a couple hundred years prior, but, um, I mean, it, it's the Salem witch trials went on for a very long time. So it's not as though, I mean, the paganism is still in the film in, in certain points for sure. Right. Um, but yeah, you have that, you have that paganism and then you have the, too. Oh yeah. Um, but you have all that combining in the end in such a, uh, climactic, like, it's like it's shocking. So you have the Freudian aspect, where, or the Freudian like Oedipusian aspect, where yep. the younger overtakes the older to yeah. to as to ascend and like you know take what is what he believes is his or like yeah. There's like a patriarchal patriarchal struggle between the two characters throughout the film. 
Right. And so as he's doing that to, you know, reach his uh, reach his end, end goal as Prometheus to, you know, take the fire, get the knowledge, share mm-hmm. it with us. Um, he, he suffers a uh, he suffers a uh, what is it? Uh, he flies too close to the sun. He suffers yeah. a uh, literally. Yeah. Why can't I? Uh, why can't I think of it? It's uh, he had the wing, the wax wings. We've been talking too much about Greek stuff. It's all lost. Um, <laughs> it's all lost in the end. Yeah, I mean, no, um, no, no. Yeah, um, dang it, wax wings. I'm, I'm, I'm missing you too. No, it's uh, Icarus. Yeah, exactly. Are you referring his, to Icarus? Yeah, his father Daedalus crafted him the wax wings, and then he flew too close to the sun, and then his wings melted, and he ascended back to Earth. Oh right, okay, yeah. So yeah, so, Daedalus. Yeah, so when he when he goes and he, you know, opens Pandora's box and then is subjected to whatever horrors or whatever pleasures that are up there, he is eventually repulsed or rejected by it, and right. then is he descends to uh, he descends crashing. down the lighthouse, crashing down. Right? Yeah, crashing to Earth. It has a beautiful uh, Fibonacci sequence shoot as he just kind of falls, <laughs> like falls down there, like before <laughs> yeah. and after. And then he meets his uh, uh, Promethean fate, uh, splayed apart uh, across the across the, the waste. Rocks. Yeah, and, and, and by, being, being picked, picked apart, apart by, by the souls. by the damned, the souls of the damned. Well, there's also like the the archetype, like the the archetype of the theory of uh, the archetype um, regarding like the shadow, where like because there is also like the identity theory about the film, where like the two characters are actually in one, and each represents like a shadow esque or dark side of one another. Like Thomas um, is the primal urges, and then or yeah. sorry, old's the primal urges. No, 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 yeah, yeah, he would the young old. Then, well, yes, the, the, and then the faux character would be the primal. Yeah, and then young urges. would be the ego or the uh like the rationality so Mm -hmm. yeah you could say like uh wake being the id is like the impulse and like winslow being the ego he's like more conscious yeah 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 yeah. more entrenched in knowledge right okay i could see that too yeah i mean there's 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 just a ton packed in here well then all yeah from a if you if you if you go by uh, Nietzsche as well, uh, you could say that Wake is a man of morality, solely right and wrong. Just this is good, this is bad. Do this. If you don't do that, then you are wrong. Where uh, Winslow uh, functions more autonomously, where he's like he gives, he hopes for agency, he hopes for independence, he hopes for like rationality. So that's why he feels so betrayed when he's like he's been jerking in the tool shed, man. He's been getting yeah, drunk. He's like, dude, he says it too. He's well, he wrote it in like he wrote it in like the um the like job performance thing or um like the yeah. the log. Oh, he basically and, says and he's, been, he's been abusing himself in the in the work shed, right. And you'll and notice he's pissed he, off about it because like he's it's almost like if and if he takes on that 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 Nietzsche that Nietzsche role of uh like more black and white morality, um, then he's he would be disgusted by like or he would be turned off by um Winslow's like hedonistic ways. Right. But you'll notice he only finds the knowledge of that um of the logbook when he partakes in the drink. The day after well the talking. logbook actually floats to him in the well yeah cause, so cause the room's flooded at that point so yeah so after the night of in drinking water. yeah so after the night of drinking he is uh he feels sick he keels over he throws up and then the book book floats by so the whole time he's been uh he's been ch- chasing knowledge through fire like you know through like the through oh, the, the wretch too the wretch is so perfect too because it's like vile he's like entrenched in what is vile to him because he's yep, the because fire. it's it's he's disgusted with it but with that yeah. it brings him to the it's like what takes to bring him to the knowledge yeah i mean i think like uh, on the, in terms of the other characters they all seem to tie in pretty perfectly in terms of greek mythology but like most so the prometheus proteus uh relationship between the two is that's pretty obvious i think that can that can basically yeah. all be confirmed i mean it's pretty, oh yeah it's pretty clearly a, a fact well, oh, no, actually, no, it is because um, I believe it is a re- they, they have like been quoted to say it's a reimagining of uh, while Proteus and Pro- Prometheus have not met in Greek mythology, um, it would be very easy to see those two interacting. Yeah, there's also Freudian and uh, Freud and Young um, 
you know, and basically each like fever. I think he was quoted as saying like they he wanted he would have liked to imagine them feverishly eating their popcorn watching the film, like um, because there are, there are aspects of both theories in the film, and like so, he wanted to piss off both of them. I think Young's more correct though. I feel like Young's actually kind of got it. So if you look at it, me from, too, me too. Carl Young you, definitely seemed to have um, a, a, a more. Yo, um, let's let's be real. Freud just had a hot mom. Yeah, he must have had a hot mom. And he just wanted to be like, you know, everyone wants to have sex with their mom. I can prove it. Yeah. And then everyone's like, nah, dude, like, I don't really. He's like, nah, I'm telling you, you do. It's not just me. It's not just that, though, because he obviously had his theories about, like, his psychological theories about, like, the dreaming, um, being, meaning, like, um, like, the young, it's all about the unconscious. And I know that, like, he tied that directly to, like, Oedipus. Oedipus. Uh, well, that was, uh, yeah, everything's about sex. Everything leads to sex or power. Yeah. Which, yeah, yeah, because. It, I mean, that's what fucking Hitler thought too, though. Carl, like, Carl, Carl Jung was a lot better, if you ask me, when it comes to like the uh, subconscious of the like the dream world and stuff right. like that. Um, what else? Yeah, what was I gonna say about that though? Yeah, oh yeah, about his uh, archetypes. Um, I had him down here somewhere. Yeah, so um, they're almost on the opposite ends of the scale of the archetypes. Uh, the uh, uh old would want to be like a sage or like a ruler which is uh, he pretty much just wants to you know it's a power dynamic or it's like a wisdom dynamic and ephraim is a outlaw and a jester or a fool so yeah. the outlaw well they, that's just, pretty that's pretty that's splayed out pretty that's that's pretty obvious throughout the film like yeah because because i would spend i would say that most of the film i would say the larger percentage of the film is occup- the power position is occupied by um by uh wake Mm-hmm. For obvious and, reasons, and then uh, Ephraim Winslow is not even Ephraim Winslow. He's playing a character, so he's playing a jester, and then also he's an outlaw because he would he would like change from uh from his previous thing, and he's willing to you know get it by any means, and he's technically on the lamb too. So it's kind of it's a really yeah, that's true. Yeah, right, right, because he's a band. He's actually well, he's actually adopted a new character. So yeah, that was, yeah, the jester aspect would be in play there too. Um. Yeah, I mean, we kind of touched on the, uh, is it a horror film aspect? Um, and we, we were discussing like the, uh, I would say the tropes don't really, the tropes make it more of like a mythos slash psychoanalysis or, or psychological film um, in terms of like the writing and the construction of the plot. But like there there are aspects of the clear horror film. Yeah, um, no, there's a, it's, there's like, gro- like guys splayed out at the end. Come on. Yeah, he's getting, he's getting picked apart. apart by, by, that's, right, yeah. There's there's the severed head like it's horrifying. There's the axe scene, the jump scare. The they they a lot of the music was made on a thing called the apprehension engine. If that's yeah, we're not talking for about a, a horror film here. If that's sure. not for a horror film, it's not for <laughs> yeah. a comedy. It's not for a right. romance. Yeah. Um, well, let, let's. I'll read a couple of little tidbits about like the making of the film. Um, the cast and crew filmed under extreme weather conditions, freezing temperatures, cold Atlantic water, intense winds, snow, wind, or I'm sorry, uh, snow, winds, intense winds, snow, rain, and no protective flora on the 4Q uh, terrain kept them exposed to the elements throughout the shoot. Three nor'easters blew across Cape Forku in Nova Scotia during various stages of the production. Much of the film was shot in real weather elements, so rain and wind machines weren't needed most of the time. Uh, with director Robert Eager stating that the most crazy and dramatic stuff was shot for real. The crew had to film the scene where Pattinson's character goes into the sea at night when the weather settled because they were afraid they might lose him to a riptide. Jesus. So, like, this is the type of shit you don't hear about with uh, filmmaking where these guys are... Um, I mean, they, uh, do you think they method acted this? I kind of, and I kind of feel like they did. I believe it's actually noted that they they barely spoke to each other. Um, yeah, right here it says Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson stated that they barely spoke a word to each other on set and were too exhausted to hang out, too exhausted to hang out together after a day of shooting because filming was so physically demanding due to the miserable weather conditions. While Pattinson stayed at a normal hotel with the rest of the film crew during the shoot, Dafoe lived in a little fisherman's cottage in solitude. On set, on the other hand, Pattinson would tend to eat and stay by himself during filming breaks while Defoe stayed with the crew. Both stated they liked each other very much as soon as they had their first real conversation a few months later. Holy shit, man. Dang. That's how you get those, that's how you get the performances that you get from these two actors. They just, like, they they went all in on the film, um, which is just incredible. 
Um, I mean, he, the, I, I gotta say, like, I, I do think, um, well, I think it's kind of tough and I do understand why this film didn't land with, um, like big audiences and it, it is, it's, it's a bit controversial. I was reading like about, I was reading a lot of the, um, commentary about the film in the internet sphere and people, some people just genuinely hated it. Um, I can't understand why i guess i i guess i get why it wouldn't land with folks because it is like most of what we've been talking about today is are some of the deeper philosophical aspects of the film that are kind of um you know uh, boiling beneath the surface so to speak but um i don't know it's still a beautiful film to, to, to view and the it's harrowing it's not boring i mean i don't find it boring particularly um the, the language, I guess, would be the thing that, that I point to to lose a viewer. Um, only because it is authentic for the time and you could lose you could lose folks in translation. Um, I had a friend who I watched it with on one of my later uh, views, and they I, I consider them very like cultured when it comes to like movies and they didn't like it just because uh, they like like theater a little more and they fig- they in their opinion, it was a little um, just people being mean for the sake of being mean. And while there is like the uh, the artistic aspect, that kind of uh, dude, there's a group of people who go to the movies to solely have a good time, uh, not to like uh, right. be. They want to be entertained, but not like no, uh, not to be snobbish or anything. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you. It's not. It's not a comment on that. It's more. I I would agree with you because there there are like it's something to do to go to the to go to the movies especially if you live we live in central new york where like it's the weather's horrific and like it's like something to do in winter and um gets you indoors um and uh it's it can be enjoyable and there's a lot of films that will scratch that itch it's it's hard to uh suggest to people other than like the star-studded film cast because like like all right look i'm gonna preface you with this that it's going to be William, Willem Dafoe Farton and then uh, Robin Pattinson's going to jerk it off so that's like you just gotta you're either going to really like it or you're going to be weirded he's out jerk but... off, he's going to jerk off to a fetish uh, uh, mermaid and that's uh, I really like that how it's like by definition like a literal fetish like it's a looking yeah I thought that was fire. you pointed to that in our previous episode and I thought that was like that was um that was perfect yeah I mean it was a perfect touch by mm-hmm. ears um, I'm oh you... perfect touch Oh geez. Oh yeah. Oh man. Yeah, you got me. Perfect touch by uh Hey listen, I had to round it out. We needed at least one more in there. One yeah, more, perfect touch sexual reference. Perfect touch by Patterson too, I hear. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> he seemed to Except he seemed for to when be... he was clearing out the chamber pots. Bit of shit there. Oh, I'm sorry. We're we've got Siri just interrupting the podcast, so that's always good. Um <laughs> Anyways, uh, I wanted to hit a couple more little tidbits about the uh, the stories, you know, behind the filmmaking. Um, there was one more that I thought was pretty interesting. Um, yeah, this is the one. So uh, before filming began, Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson rehearsed with Robert Eagers for a week in a hotel in Halifax, Nova Scotia. While Dafoe loved to rehearse, um, given his extensive theater background, Pattinson didn't, didn't want to show and let out too much beforehand, preferring to jump directly into the scene blindly. He found the rehearsal process frustrating and uncomfortable, being used to uh, react impulsively in front of the camera and getting self-conscious by thinking too much about the scene beforehand. His method be- uh, being that if he accomplished um, accomplishes certain things in rehearsal, it will later ruin the spontaneity and feel fake in front of the camera. Director Robert Eagers welcomed that the two worked so differently and stated, they have this incredible electric chemistry on screen, but it was chemistry through tension. That couldn't uh, have been better for the movie. Rob hated to rehearse because he wanted to surprise me and Willem, but most mostly surprise himself with what he would do in the scene. Rob tends to be the best in the first take, and in his first take, and he feared he would ruin that, so he held back in the rehearsal period. That that decision to uh, have, like, in my opinion, when I read that, I thought to myself one thing: a lesser director would have would have ruined that. Like a lesser director would yeah. absolutely what he would have demanded uh, like anybody because co directors can have egos too. And, and you know, he's a young director and these guys have been in the industry probably a lot longer than him. But he had the he had the wherewithal to say, yeah, let's go with that. It actually works for the film. And I think it really fucking does. I think it really the spontaneity of like 
like him like panting by the way there there's a scene where he's like panting like a dog too um in like complete madness um which is is also just harkens back to the the dog trope and and it does seem like so their dynamic too like uh Will- willem defoe's character everything seems a lot more rehearsed a lot more like he's a lot more confident in what he's saying like this is the truth it just worked that way this, yeah and it just so happens how it is that. right and yep. and if he's if he is proteus then that's exactly how he should come off is is um he's in the power dynamic he's in the right side of the power dynamic he's winning the and, power struggle and prometheus is going to be uns- unsure he's going to be unsure if he's doing the right thing sure if, if he should really take the flame but then once- he's surrounded by water yep surrounded by water so he's withheld or he's or he's and withdrawn it's- and it's also um it's kind of like a uh, like a social commentary as well on um like you know it's uh, and those have been getting popular too it's like parasite or there's a couple other movies that i can't really think of right now but like just a rich versus poor um oh, the right. only, well, yeah for sure yeah the only thing that um that young wants to do he's like i just want to get my own plot of land where no one could tell me nothing to, or tell me what to do and like that's that that's all he wants. He just right. wants literally what old has just a little place where no one can tell him what to do, where he's yeah. the boss, where he's a, a that... boring story, right? A very boring right. story. And um, it gets one level deeper. If you uh, put in the, uh, what, uh, what wake says with the goals being the spirits of dead sailors. So what that would be is uh, they're borderline, like in like a, I don't want to say like purgatory, but they're like on Earth, literally. No, that's referred to the purgatory thing is real. Like that's actually a consideration because, well, there's like the the aspect of like the survivalist trope of, of being like trapped that, on the. And that would make sense. That would make sense. Char and bringing them there. Well, because you have the you have well you have the light, which would represent. Uh, the, which would re- represent what the desires are of Prometheus' character, and mm-hmm. then you have that surrounded by ocean, which would be what Proteus is most um, would, would would be his preference. So you are trapped between the two, and you have both in the film in one location, um, t- and and each each character is being tugged and pulled at their preferences to and fro. So it is a purgatory aspect. I mean, you could you could definitely. You could force that in there a little bit if you if you had to, but yeah, so so if they're in purgatory, when they get finally judged, um, they become the seagulls. So that is the it's the souls of dead sailors. Uh, right. Oh, sure, yeah. So what? And they all is, flock at the end. They, like you don't actually see like a flock of seagull until the very end when he's right. Well, there's a couple like in the air and stuff, and they're they're always not uh, a flock though. Not like at the end. There's like uh, there's like literally thirty or forty flocking like flying yeah. No, there's. Above. There's an Alfred Alfred Hitchcock like scene where there's a bunch of seagulls in the air at one point. Yeah. Um, well, that's the birds, right? Yeah. But uh, so what that would be is they are ascending. They are over the work. They are over the cycle that usually continues in the lighthouse. Whether it's uh with the old wiki uh succumbing to it, uh, wanting to be in uh, control of the power, or the no. new guy who ends up breaking the cycle and usurping it and then falling victim to you know a fate worse than the cycle um it's a uh, oh dang where was i getting that um so if you're a seagull once you finally die you you are above the 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 conundrum above uh, all the uh above, above the hubbub uh so it's the it's like the american dream or like pretty much so you don't need to worry about like work you don't need to worry about like uh, power dynamics but you get to laugh at the people who work at it or who need to do that you get to just look literally look down upon them and be like haha you have to do that and that is that's the best thing that's offered to these sailors is just to laugh at the trivialities that they had to (laughs) experience in their life yeah what did you think about well he does he does do the cooking and i thought that was an interesting um that was an interesting conversation at the end where like they represented, they each represented like he almost uh wakes character is almost representing like a, uh, a wife. Um, and they have like that, like he, Oh, you don't like my cooking conversation. Oh, like, you don't uh, like my cooking. You, you like you're my cooking. fond of me, mo- of me lobster. Ain't yeah. I seen it. You fond of me and, lobster. Say it, say it. You I know don't have that to time, say nothing. That you whole know conversation what? is that. You know, at that time, uh, feeding prisoners lobsters was considered cruel and unusual punishment because, like, sea bugs. 
Ooh, yeah. So that's yeah. no good. No good. But the well, thing is, the thing is, he's so awake, so seasoned as a sailor. He's like, you put a little butter on that. He's like, y'all crazy. Oh, yeah. He's like, they also, like they're in a great spot. I mean, they're off the coast of New England. That's where it takes right. place. So I mean, if you're gonna, and that's what he says too. He goes, uh, he goes, you cook the lobster up right. He goes better than any fin meat. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. He does say that. Yeah. And then he gets, but that's the thing that actually it's so funny because, and I wonder why this is. It's like, um, it's kind of unanswered, but that's what actually calls upon the uh, the like cursing, the the hark the hark Triton, where he actually. Um, where he then well, so you know the, the you want to you want to know why? Because it's the one thing he didn't have control over. He could tell him go. And his food sucked. Go work. Go yeah. do this. It is your job to go do. But that. he couldn't force him to like the meal. You can't exactly. You can't force him to do that. And he's yeah. like, I refuse. I refuse to. He's like, I'm not going to hear friend. Say nothing. I'm not going to relent. It could yeah. be the best thing i've ever had in the world and he even said he's like nah he's like i used to have donuts every day ham yeah. the size of your fist fried donuts yep <laughs> he <laughs> says that's right yep yeah he's i like, like it i like how he, about... he goes on the he well he goes on the 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 the, the like the beautiful um uh and i'm not sure how, what you would call it what the theatrical aspect of like that that part of the script where he's where he's uh cursing him uh, by the strike, by the by the wrath of Neptune, and, and at the long, at the, throughout the long end of it, he ends it with uh, Ephraim just saying, "All right, have it your way. I like your cooking." I mean, he's have it your way. I like your cooking. Yeah, yeah just, no, that is like legitimately hilarious. It's some of the most beautiful writing in terms of the curse. Like, like, I mean, hark, Triton, hark, bellow, bid our father, the sea king, rise from the depths, full foul in his fury, black waves teeming with salt foam to smother this young mouth with pungent slime to choke ye, engorging your organs till ye turn blue and bloated the the bilge and brine and can scream no more. I mean, there's this beautiful writing, and then it cuts to like the weakest writing in the film with Ephraim. But that's 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 right. hearkening to the, what you were saying about his being his character being like a jester or a foolish character. Um, mm -hmm. he just so, he continues playing the fool right what does it's, he say it's, like, a, it's unbelievable he, go ahead i'm sorry yeah no he's like a he's like bursting ye a a bloody bulge no more but a film for like harpies and uh harpies and like everything to feed upon like yeah no he's he's like thorough in it. and that's the thing so he says that to what i say he said he does two curses he says that to ephraim winslow and the thing is that was kind of ephraim winslow's fate he was swallowed up by oh the right sea, yeah yeah swallowed forgotten up, have you spilled his beans yet though no no he didn't no yeah so he just happened to make well, all knowing right yeah yeah should pale death with the treble uh dread. The treble dread Make the ocean, um, make the ocean caves our bed. God who hearsed the surges rolled is deign to save the suppliant soul. I mean, the, the writing in this film cannot be matched. I mean, it is it's it's so gorgeous and it's so. Um, I, I it's almost you would hear this periodic dialogue being written for like a period piece in um, ancient Rome or. Um, you know, you you know the films. You know the films I'm talking about. Gladiator and uh, when he yeah. crowned in cockle shells, lifts up his fell befin arm. His coral tine trident screeches banshee like in the tempest. <laughs> it's so good, man. It's so good. It's so gorgeous. <laughs> I like when he, well, there's also like the sexual innuendo is like, is just like dribbled throughout the film. Dude, so here's the like, thing. Yeah, he, even Robert Eager says it. He goes, uh, he's like, they're living in like a phallic shaped thing. Dude, it's a, right. it's a, it's a phallic shaped object that at the tip shoots light all over the place. Not only that, uh, but they're shoot, semen. Like, they're yes. Semen. And here's okay. the thing too in, in the scene where they're painting the lighthouse, the only thing they get on that is the, uh, what's the, medical term for it it would be the corpus spongi spongiosum the like the bottom of your wiener they paint like the line on the bottom of the dick that's all they get they go like from tip to like oh, down, yeah, and, and then, then he, he falls, falls off. and then he falls yeah, off they right, only yeah. paint the the bottom like the yeah the bottom base of the the, the what is it the corpus yeah. spongiosum 
That's the, so know, they literally just. I don't know the medical them. term, but I know the I know the the point of the. I know the location you're referring to. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Like they don't even if the if the tower tower wasn't phallic enough, they're like, all right, let's just get this little fucking whoop on one side and done. Yeah, it's and, and to harken to harken, I just wanted to drop this quote in there, like to harken to your like theories about Prometheus. Uh, he actually does say, "Oh, what protean forms swim up from men's minds and melt in hot Promethean blunder, scorching eyes with divine shames and horror, and casting them down to Davy Jones." Like, so he he need, it's directly in the writing. It's in the it's yeah. in the the script. So and, and it, it's hard a, to deny it. Or to uh, at it. Uh, so if we categorize the lighthouse as a uh, Pandora, then uh, Pandora was gifted. It was the like a beautiful woman crafted uh, by Earth, and uh, she was given a bunch of stuff by the gods. Athena taught her needlework and weaving. Don't really know how to tie that into there. Um, Aphrodite uh, shed grace upon her head. Grace, you know, shed light upon her head. <laughs> right. Yep. A uh, cru- and cruel longing and cares that weary the that weary the limbs, like the lighthouse. Cruel longing and cares that weary the limbs. So, like all oh, the toil right. that you had to do. Uh, Hermes gave her a shameless mind and deceitful nature. The deceitful nature of the lighthouse, and he also gave her the power of speech and lies and crafty words. So, the lies of the lighthouse, the deceitful nature of it, um, and then Athena clothed her. Uh, uh, persuasion and uh, charitus adorned her with necla- necklaces uh, and finery, uh, but uh, Hore adorned her with a garland crown, the crown of the you know the peak of the lighthouse, and then Hermes gave her the name Pandora, which is all gift. Yeah, I mean, his also like uh, the language is um, well. It, it, it points exactly to what you were saying about him being like the fool too, because like there's one moment where it's actually, so you have that long um, cursing at the, at um, after the conversation with the lobster, right? The, and, the, and, and um, uh, she has a, a curse as well. Uh, they each gave a gift and she also has a, a plague to men who eat bread. Uh, historically, uh, what have you seen uh, the menu? I have not. That's a pretty uh, another uh, social commentary about stuff. So they have a really good uh, scene and rendition to uh, to this. Uh, bread is typically the food of the poor man. Uh, you you break bread. You partake in the bread. You, you break know, bread. Body right. of Christ. Uh, right. It's yeah. all bread. It's if you're if you're rich, you can eat steak. You know, you can do whatever you want, and you can yeah, have the pastries. Poor, the poor are left for the bread. You are subjected right. to just bread. So, yeah. um. That goes to show that uh, that old was legitimate. He was right. He was like, you cannot handle lighthouse to keep. I am made different. I am better than you. Um, I am made to tend this. You cannot do it. It will like you're gonna go crazy. And then uh, so it's a plague to man who eat who. It's a plague to all men who eat bread. Uh, uh, he didn't eat bread. He ate lobster. He was a he was the upper echelon. He was eating yeah. you know the high end with lobster. Well, also subject. He's also subjugated to that role because he he says if I had a steak I'd fuck it. Which, yeah, he's like, <laughs> like, like he's, right, and mean, exactly. Like, so he, yeah, he's forced to eat what he needs to. He's forced to eat the bread mm-hmm. to break bread with him. He wants it, but he wants a steak. He doesn't yeah. want lobster. But you know, if you were if you were the elite, you're eating lobster. You're eating all this stuff, and that is what he's used to. The fi- he's used to the plunder of the sea. Yeah. So um, it's just he really is uh, the upper class. Uh, he gets to it's just him and that it's just him and uh, Eph- Ephraim and or Young. So it's kind of hard to tell. Like they're both in a shitty situation, uh, almost literally at points. But he it's the upper class, lower class, uh, like with a with a magnifying glass on it. Yeah, and then like, but, well, I was gonna just point out that like the inverse of that cursing at the beginning after the conversation regarding the food. Like or the meal, the meal preparation. Um, mm-hmm. So like he goes on this beautiful, like beautifully written um, rant, uh, cursing him and basically some like basically predicting his fate. By the way, um, or, yeah. or 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 uh, or or um, forcing his fate, or you know, depending on how you view it. But then I thought it was just such a perfect uh, inverse when 
Ephraim eventually winds up um, with his own rant in, in which is like capped off by like a, by Thomas just basically saying like, cause Ephraim basically just goes on saying, complaining about his, his like farting and his like his piss smells. And he smells like jism, like rotten dick or curdled foreskin. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, and then at the, like, it's just, and it's just very crude and like poorly constructed or articulated. And then wakes just, you have a way with words, dummy, which is just fucking perfect. It's a perfect inverse to what that earlier Right, um, they just both like is. they're just both like not really listening. Like, <laughs> yeah, they're both not listening at all. They're just snapping. They're just like, uh, but his is but wakes is like so much more elegant and um, purposeful because clearly he's like he's actually um, he's cursing him into the, his demise um, from the uh, by the uh, souls of the damned to be picked apart, um, uh, Forgotten to any man to any time, forgotten to any god or devil, forgotten even to the sea for any stuff for, for part of Winslow, even any scantling of your soul is Winslow no more, but is now itself the sea. Yeah, the see, sea. and then at the end when he says is now not a part of yourself or is now like not Winslow anymore. Right. So it's like he, no. at that that's point, the identity. That's the identity. Yeah. Uh, and he, uh, he removes flipping. that's what, right after that. He's like, I got to tell you. He goes. I. He's like. Yeah. I killed Winslow. I really. Then he starts spilling his beans. Yeah, and but because it's because he starts. legitimately was cursed. Like he was like yeah. Winslow's dead. What are you gonna do yeah. about that? And then he's like, uh, it is. Uh, sorry, he is dead. But yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, we've gone on pretty long. This has been a. But we knew we were gonna go long on this film. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's one of the. It's one of the better films in the past probably ten years or so. Um. It's it's just an absolute masterpiece. If anybody has not any any of our listeners, if you haven't had a chance to view it and you've heard what we had to say about it, um, I urge you to go back and look for the things that we discussed about the film um, within it because they, it will. I don't know if it will enhance the uh, viewing I- enjoyment. It, it might actually it make it. It makes it, it for it, me, but not not on, but not on for yeah because the second time right because everybody does the same thing with this film like it's it could, because it's so. There's just, um, you know, there's folklore and mythicism and there's, uh, you know, uh, there's albatrosses and, and Greek mythology and all, all of this is just so, um, it's so thick um, in terms of symbolism and meaning that it's, it, the first thing you want to do is start reading about the film after you've viewed it because it is, it's, it's thrilling as a film experience, but it is so, you know, thick with, with meaning. So a um, lot to peel apart. If you haven't seen it, um, any of our listeners, please jump back and give this a give this movie give this movie the time of day. I do I do think in about twenty years, uh, fifteen or twenty years, maybe not even that long, people will circle back to this film and get and it'll be a it'll be a cult film that will um, have a revisitation process. Oh. Um, Fun, uh, fun fact about, uh, or at least it's more like not fact, but fun fan theory for me. So, uh, at one point, uh, at one point, old says, I believe, uh, he says something about, uh, the last wiki thought that St. Elmo cast his fire into the light itself, which is, you know, uh, it's something that's, that's seen. It's like a, an electromagnetic, uh, thing that like happens uh at like spires or like points of of stuff so uh if that's true it's really cool like they made the lighthouse and then once the discharge came like made like shut that around it but if that's the case then the color of that light um while it might just like shine like a regular light like the inside of the actual light if it's saint Neville's fire would be blue or violet that lighthouse would be fucking crazy (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it would be. It would be really, yeah. yeah, it'd be like, yeah. dude, I need to look at that. It's like I, I, I don't even worry about it. I can't it. not look at it. Yeah, right. Well, that's like, uh, that's like actually something that was played. Um, there's like uh, the film Nope uh, by uh, Jordan Peele, which Jordan Peele has a lot of film. He's got three films out as well, which all three have a lot of this kind of thing where there's just meanings stretched throughout, but like um he takes on like spectacleism like it's like a ufo film where like the whole point like the the power of the U- of the art of uh, extraterrestrial is to like not look at it um and it's supposed to be a social commentary on like spe- on spectacleism in society 
mostly being like social media and all that. And um, that's like, that's the lighthouse in, in, a, in an essence in that, in that theory where it's like, it's titillating for, well, you have, a, you have the caretaker or the lighthouse keeper who's like genuinely um, he's like getting off while in the, while in the lighthouse. And like, I don't know how to, you can't titillate a man you can't if you can't attract the attention of a of a young man any faster than to show him where like sexual pleasure is. Um, so like his attention being focused on the lighthouse is like it, it the um like the the drawing of of attraction or attention by uh wins by um Ephraim Winslow is like it's just inevitable based on what happens in the film. Um and it draws him to it clearly and he becomes more and more obsessed about it till the end but just a masterpiece i mean I, I, it's 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 truly one of the better films uh Dude, you're you're gonna get your eyes on really good movie um it starts off in a haze and it ends in a haze literally it literally starts really, off yes, in a haze perfect. and like the first scene is like when it, it it almost goes into the, like the olympic like right back into the greek gods it's like the first day on earth uh, when it was made, a god separated heaven and sea, and then it's just gray screen, and then you see the sea, and then you see the uh, sky, and then you see the boat come in. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's perfect. It's a perfect ending. It's a perfect conclusion to what is a hard. Well, we'll get into whether or not it's a perfect film. Um, it's for me. It's pre- it's as close to a perfect film as you can get, but. Um, we're going to take a short break. Let's do a short break. Uh, we've been going pretty long. Um, we're going to close things out when we get back from this break on Robert Eager's, uh, Robert Eager's masterpiece, The Lighthouse from 2019. We, uh, we'll close this thing out with a rating, a quick summarization of our thoughts on the film, what we appreciated most about it. Um, we'll actually talk a little bit about its reception in the uh, critical sphere in terms of uh, critical reception um talk a little bit about that give our rating and tell you what's next on the peripheral views podcast from hang tight we'll be right back Yes, we uh, we talked the lighthouse for a couple hours here, and we um, we had a lot to say about it. There's a ton going on with this film. Um, it made it easy to do a podcast about because there's just an endless well of information um, and theories you can uh, you can get yourself um, involved with. And um, excuse me, my series is going to go off again in just a second, but that's all right. Um, it's a it's a it's an amazing film, um, Errol. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the uh, critical reception. So this is where it gets a little, you get a little frustrated. I mean, it has a good Rotten Tomatoes uh, approval rating of 90%, which is, that's that's about right. I mean, I, I feel like that's fair. Um, it's a pretty high Rotten Tomatoes rating. Um, yeah. the, uh, so let's see. Um, get a quick review quickly. <laughs> um. Owen Gleiberman of Variety called the film darkly exciting and made uh, made with extraordinary skill, commenting that the movie Building on the Witch proves that Robert Eagers possesses something more than impeccable genre skill. He has the ability to lock you into the fever of what's happening on screen. 
Uh, Robbie Collin of the Daily Telegraph gave the tone a perfect score, calling Defoe's excuse me, performance astounding and comparing Pattinson's to that of Daniel Day Lewis in There Will Be Blood, saying, There's no comparison, that's no comparison to make the lightly, but everything about the lighthouse lands with a crash. It's cinema to make your head and soul ring. What do you think about that? That is a heavy, heavy comparison. Well, try to think of anything closer. It's harder to do. It's harder to wrestle anything up that's more like a period. I, to- I totally agree. I totally agree. Like it is not thing- as good. It's certainly not as good a performance. I, I don't think that that's, I think that would be, that would be pushing it too far. But it's, but I well, think what you the, said is exactly true. But it's the, as the close only reason, to it as it The only reason it's not is because, not the only reason, but one of the reasons it's not is because, uh, well, well, yeah. So he's going to take away, and Daniel Day Lewis, like, is the, like, he is that film. I don't want to say protagonist, and I don't even want to say antagonist. I just want to say antagonist. He's just he's the anti-hero sort of. Dude, he's no, he's something. a jerk, dude. He's the he's a piece he's of shit. Monster, he's so dude, he's, he's a terrible guy. He's he's the worst. Not even, he's dude, I'm, I'm, we have to talk about that, but I'm more scared to talk about that than I am about this. Oh, I know. Well, there's there's even more going on with that, in my opinion. Although I I don't know. I mean, this film was pretty pretty packed but there will be blood says a lot more about america um the country and i the actually American think I dream would, yeah there's just so much about, about capitalism about um you know imperialism about greed you want to know greed, one one aspect sure. i you want to know one aspect i liked or even like love about where or there will be blood let's hear it the uh the oil it's like the more oil he gets, the more evil it is, and it's like a black substance, like an ichor, and like he just <laughs> yeah, yeah. he just needs more of the oil. He flowing. just needs yeah. more of that black, just fuel, and like well, it also comes from the bowels of hell. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And he he's just letting he's the like evil out of the ground, out of the and earth. he's and he's soaking in it to the I, point where it hurts, when he it baptizes hurts all his, his ch- he baptizes his child with it. It hurts all of his his relationships, all of his destroys it. Every, his it, it destroys his life, it destroys his his psyche, yeah. and it's it just the fact that it's just a black substance and that it yeah. just doesn't. There's so much. Good. There's so much with that film. That film is on the horizon. Don't you folks worry if if uh, you're a fan. The, the only um, reason we didn't talk about the lighthouse in one of our first couple episodes is because we were scared of it. Yeah, no shit, no doubt about that. And the same goes for There Will Be Blood. Like, that's just such an undertaking. This was an undertaking. We wanted to make sure we had our ducks in a row and had um, done our research and viewed the film enough times to, like, truly get an opinion and a theory or two uh, articulated or, you know, at least be able to articulate our theories. Because, listen, like, um, we have, we you know, we, we can do all the research we want, but, like, the, the filmmaker – the filmmaker themselves is going to be able to be tell is going to be able to tell you what the film's about, and if they choose not to, I, I think that's great. I always well, and that's also Cooper, that's Cooper kind of what, did that, and that's kind of what he did too. Um, with like some of the inspirations from uh from uh Alfred Hitchcock, uh, there was like a scene where like it was the one where he's like, "Bad luck to kill a seabird," and um, he was just thinking like Alfred Hitchcock would be like, you know, like he shot that with too much clarity. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's true. And lo- he actually says the same thing about Lovecraft. Like, Lovecraft, he indicated that he thought Lovecraft would, like, um, he would have made, like, the, he would have made the light, um, he would have made the light within the lighthouse, like, um, like an, a passage, a passageway to God or heaven. Um, or so he would have, like, in, he, it would have been a I, dimension. That's what he feared. Yeah, he would have theorized. He theorized that that's how uh, Lovecraft would have handled it, and he, he t- obviously took it a little bit of a different direction. But um, I don't know. We, we're going to cap off the theorizing on the film because it is there's a lot to say about it. We could always do a part. Well, two what do you? Line. What do you think the light is? I, I'm torn because I do. I do agree with your theory has a lot of merit, and I think there's a lot to be said about like it representing knowledge, but like. It just for me, it doesn't explain the the sec- the sensuality of it. I think that like there's two things going on in play in my mind. It's like the 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 uh, the disconnect of like the the identity pro- uh, you know aspect where like you have two characters who are both like who could represent just one character, but they're also having like a domestic. There, I think there's like a domestication of the relationship that's like um, that unfolds within madness. Where um well the the lighthouse literally deteriorates as their uh 
as both of their psyches and relationship does. Right. Uh, they, as their as their minds do. Uh uh Young tries to repair the lighthouse and their relationship and every he tries to keep everything repaired, but it just continues to uh, degrade until you get to the end where it's literally in shambles. And the only thing they can do is uh, just drink it and ignore or drink yeah. about it. And ignore. There's also I think there's also like a little bit of commentary about like alcoholism, too. Like um, it's it's a it's a smaller message, but I think that like the definitely more that pro, they can. Definitely what? a pro smoking movie. <laughs> well yeah and at the, well at, in in terms of like in contrast to the alcoholism because and it's the more they seen, drink the more things fall apart and it's always smoking's always been seen at least uh back in the day as an intellectual thing like you, you kind of sit around you just puff on a puff on a pipe puff on talk a pipe. about some stuff more sexual innuendo right there there you go mm. <laughs> it's just everywhere on this film uh <laughs> um well, a couple more little comments from the uh critics of the world let's see um peter bradshaw of the guardian in addition to praising the performances of defoe and pattinson also praised the screenplay stating that the script is barnacled love it nice with resemblances of colbridge shakespeare melville and there's also some staggeringly cheeky black comic riffs and gags and the two of them um resemble no one such so much as wilford brambell and Harry H. Corbett, Steptoe and Son in Hell. <laughs> I mean, that's great. That's a good comment right there. I actually like that. That's a good review. Um, so uh, a lot of good reviews, a um, couple bad ones. Dana Stevens of Slate concluded a review by stating, The Lighthouse is at its strongest when it resembles the dark comedy of a Beckett play, complete with earthy scat- scatological humor. But oh, as the mythological... So, sorry, sorry. No, I'm sorry. That's... Uh, Let me... Go- yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just finish it up, and then you can ch- you can jump right in. Um, but as the mythological references pile up and the forbidden light atop the tower accrues ever more and ever vaguer, symbolic meaning, the film sometimes seems funny, not because of not because of, but in spite of the filmmaker's intentions. And in that and that by the end, she became impatient with Eager's reliance on atmosphere to take take the place of the story, and found herself identifying with the stranded seafarers. I desperately wanted to get out. Yeah. Well, don't yeah, I can see that. Um, so I can see the frustrations if you're aware. Oh, it's almost like she might have been aware of the uh, mythological references a little so bit. She too. Was, she, it took she, her out she, of the film. So she's just waiting for him to be splown, splain apart on the sea or on the. No, I don't even think it, it's that. I think it's. I think it's more so that it's very. Um, for her, she may have been like uh, well versed in it and had seen them, um, and they are kind of scattered. Like like you just attributed. Um, in your dialogue in the, in the podcast, you just attributed like several characters. Um, and if you're aware of even a handful of them, I could see how could that could get like entangled in your viewing experience. So maybe maybe that's what happened with her. Well, yeah, um, no, if you if you know it's Prometheus, then you're like, I swear to God, if this guy ends up falling and then pecked apart by those seagulls yeah, and then it could, when it, it happens, you're right. going to be like, dude. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. Um, I could see that being like a little bit um, off. I can I can see. I can see her. Um, I can see her connection though to Samuel Beckett. Oh, um, the Beckett thing, the Beckett play for sure, right? Yeah, that yeah, I the, uh, see. I she had to have been talking about Endgame. Right, right, yeah. So it's an it's like an absurdist one act, um, and it's just between two people, a two blind people, guy. Right, it's the two yeah. people. It's like the duel of of protagonist and and um, well, not not really. A, it's. I guess it's not. Neither one of them are protagonists. I guess they're kind of both protagonists, co-protagonists, but yeah, kind of yeah. like this play here. And like, so they're waiting. Yeah, it's a tragedy something. slash comedy, right? It's a, it's a post-apocalyptic post-apocalyptic scenario, and they're both waiting for something, but they don't know what they're doing. So they're just menial labor needs to be done in the meantime and like it gets so mundane to the point where like the blind guy's sitting there and he's like, I feel like I'm not in the middle of the room and then he's like all right i'll try to move you so he moves him a bit and he's like i'd like to be like in the middle he's like let me get a ruler he's like no just like you can eyeball it it's fine and then he moves him and he's like i feel like i'm too far to the right and he's like too far to the left and he's like i'm too forward now i'm too back and then so the uh, gaslighting the it's the gaslighting thing right yeah, and also not even gaslighting, but he's just he's in the position of power for no reason on a on the cosmic coin flip, just like uh right. like yeah. old is cosmic coin flip. So he's the one who gets to tell him what to do. There's no there's no rightful reason for it. They could just hang out and be equals. 
Um, but towards the end, uh, the younger person or the guy who's doing all the stuff, he realizes like through nihilism, he's like, well, if I'm going to just have to do listen to you and nothing matters, like in the end, like I'm just going to go somewhere else and do nothing. And that's kind of it's kind of what a kind of what a Robert Pattinson does. He's just like, if I if this is going to if you're going to fire me with no pay. Like you're, I already wasted this time. I'm going crazy. Like you, I'm gonna see what's in that light. Like I, yeah, he's going for it. Like you're not. Well, that's what he me. does go for. It. That's definitely what he does go for at the plot. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, let's uh, let's do a quick um, let's do our rating. Let's do it. This is the big moment. This is our uh, this is our big our big uh, rating point in the podcast. We're gonna rate the film. Um, Errol, why don't you give us a quick summary and then uh, of, of your opinion on the film and then throw a rating at it. So, um, just, just like, uh, the, the protean ways of that sea god, how this movie is able to kind of, like, shift meanings and shift, like, you know, subjectivity on it, I think it's really good. Uh, there's not a lot of movies that I've watched, like, one time and been like, oh, this is this is kind of like weird, but like, I kind of get some of the references and, Oh, this is like, you know, there's a lot at stake here. I wonder what's going on. And then had a rewatch and then been like, Oh my God, this is like a movie within a movie. Like, um, you don't get that a lot of times, or at least like, I don't, uh, I, I really got enveloped into the, to the time period of it. Like it, you're allowed to get like sucked into it. Um, dude, it's, legit probably yeah it's one of my favorite movies of all time and therefore you're rating out of 10 sir dude i'm i'm like struggling to not give it a 10 the Don't only struggle. reason no Just the me. only the only reason i won't give it a 10 is because this is a really hard movie for me to be like hey i'm going to show you this movie and it's going to be william defoe farting and then they're both going to be jizzing. <laughs> yeah. But like, trust me, like, trust me. Like it is a, like, it's like one of those, things, like you sound crazy, like explaining it, but it literally is the case. And like, just for that, just because it's like um, a little more niche, I, I absolutely do believe it's going to be, like you said, like, it's going to be a cult classic. Like there's going to, people are going to look back on this and be like, Oh my God, like, it's like, fuck it. It's perfect. Like it's, it really is. Uh, um, I want to, I want to give it like a 9.8. Okay, nine point nine, nine no point, nine point no no point eight. It's either point five or hold a round number. You can oh, do point man. five or 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 a round number. So you got to go ten or nine point five. Sounds like you're in between the two. So now you get now I made it worse for you. <laughs> yeah, you gotta, but no, no, you got to lean one way or the other. So legitimately, if that's the case, if I have to choose between like this movie's perfect or like this movie's like perfect, but 9. it's like 5. too weird to like show someone. No, I'm gonna give it a ten. Yes, yes. because if I have to be like yo like watch this it's gonna be weird and like but there's a deeper meaning to it um if they're if you're not willing to like look past that there's not like a lot of other movies not like there's a lot of other movies but there's um i feel like if you can't look like past that to be willing to like dig deeper like that's it's not that's not fun you know what i mean like this is a fun movie through and through it's a it's a it's funny it it's hilarious if you let it be um and like just like the time period and everything and then like when you tie it in with the uh mythology and like all of the, like the folklore and just it, it's a it's a project of passion it's a uh it's I, I think it's a perfect movie so we're talking about all those other movies then uh in uh in uh, 2019 uh i, I think mm, dude i think this was a better movie than all those i really do yeah Yep, I agree. So let me let me dive in. I'm gonna this is this is, now I'm gonna take the mic on on you. And I'm gonna say that I think this film this film accomplished something that films just don't accomplish anymore. It it stands alone in a unique niche of filmmaking. Uh, and Eagers is a guy who's doing that um, with all of his films so far. He's three for three. Um, I think this is the best of those three. I thought The Witch was one of the best horror films of all time. I, I, I legitimately think that it's it's 
it's one of the few films that I was actually afraid of. Like it's at the end of the film, I was in fear. Um, and then this film rolled along and I was like, oh, well, I have to see this. What's this got to offer? And it just blew me away. And um, it's what, what, what this man is doing, what Eagers is doing to the film industry is he's taking, he's taking some of my favorite filmmakers in Hitchcock, in Kubrick. Um, there's, there's aspects of, um, you know, there's art house, like, 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 um, there's, uh, Sam Peckinpah is in here in, in, in a couple of different moments. Like there's, there's art house, uh, indie art house inspirations throughout the film. So like these, these are, these are aspects of some of the best filmmakers of all time. And he's kind of rolling them up and like authenticating them with true length with, uh, authentic, um, he's authenticating them with, um, the realities of the period right like we discussed mm -hmm. and now on, on, and on top of that why this works better than his other two films and i'm i'm so anxious to see with what a other actors he works with is that he got two actors who are who actually performed genuinely two of their best performances ever and that is saying something about a guy like willem dafoe yeah um willem dafoe has been in some of the most unbelievable films i mean this guy's career just spans you know four decades at least and he's just been great in a million movies. But this this is a whole new level because he has this unbelievable script to work with. The script is the script is is thick. It's lush with dialogue. It's like there's Tarantino in here too because like there's so it, much it's, it's movies. Some, there's so much references. Like you oh, were saying, there's, there's um, it's packed. It's packed with have, inspiration. Like we said, you have the birds. Um, I'm looking at something the right Shining. now. I guess, uh, Kiss Me Deadly in 1955. Um, right, just like. Yeah. Just which, like, by the uh, way, I think Defoe was in. I believe Defoe was in that, right? Oh, I, I'm not too familiar. All I know is that when she opens up the box, she opens up the box, and like it's just bright light. She's screaming, and you don't see what's in the box, but you don't want to succumb. Oh, no, I'm, I'm thinking of a, I'm thinking of a very different film. Kiss Me Deadly. Is oh yeah, no, this was 1955. Yeah, yeah, I'm as sorry, a, maybe no, as a baby. No, no. I'm thinking of a different film. Um, but anyway, uh, in my opinion, I think the film Ooh, has and the, so the much... lighthouse, the lighthouse keepers, nineteen twenty nine. That lighthouse like literally looks almost like it, just not as a, uh, not as crazy, not as like, dude. Can that's the reason I think the black and white like paid off so well? Because when you see that light at the end, it's just like that is magical. Like that thing is yeah. legit. Like be, that is a time machine. Like that is yeah. Yeah, there's there's so much the, there's so much this film has to offer folks, and it it rewards re, uh, repeat viewing in a major way. Like you have to see the film a few times to truly get a grip on it, which is like that I appreciate because that is what excuse me that is what Kubrick offered um, with like almost all of his films is that he demanded that you have to go back and watch this again because I'm going to move at a pace that seems slow, but there's so much happening that. It, it's almost like putting things that are bizarre on screen. And some I've noticed a lot of the commentary about this film is that like things, oh, it's just random. Things are just random. And like if you trust your filmmaker in, in the film you're watching, it's like and you trust that what they're doing is not random. It 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 gives purpose to the film in places that you might think are are purposeless. And I don't think I think most filmmakers aren't making random. There's very few random shots in films. I, I don't understand. Why that's a the first by fans, but I don't get the, it. The first shot, um, not the first shot, but one of the first shots when you go into the lighthouse, there is a knife, um, at the end, and it is not hung up; it is stabbed into the corner of the house. Ooh, interesting. I think I missed that. So, like, yeah, exactly. That's not. That's not. That's Kubrick shit. Where it's like that's not unintentional, and that's what I love about this film, and that's why, um, when it comes down to it, we did we did talk about a lot about like. The you know we talked a lot about like the films of 2019. You're damn right. This is the best film that came out that year. And 1917 is an incredible film. Joker was an incredible film, and and Joaquin Phoenix was amazing in Joker. I think both of these actors were better, and I thought this film was better. This film was definitely better. Um, I think that uh, just as we discussed today, the the layers and layers upon layers of of um, Greek mythology between the Greek mythology, the psychoanalysis, and the homoeroticism and the sexuality aspects, and the on it's top too, of it's on too top deep. of the on top of the thick and unbelievable like breathtaking performances 
and the setting and the artistic vision of the director to go 35 millimeter lens in black and white. Those those things all in conjunction with the symbolism that's in that's just completely strewn through the film and how and when you walk away from the film, the most important thing about a film, if you when you're watching film, at least in my opinion, is when you walk away, how how soon did you forget about the film? How soon how soon did the did the film leave you? This film, well, when I remember seeing it at the theater, this film stuck with me for like a week. You say that I can't hear the term beans now. Without just being <laughs> like, right, yeah. Well, it's even worse now because we're doing a full podcast on it. But being that this film stuck with me so intensely when I first saw it, and then going back to rewatching it, I was a little nervous to determine, like, oh, you know, I saw it in theater. It's in theater is always a different experience. I was just completely encapsulated in, in the theater when I saw it and loved it. And I was worried that if I watched it again at home, um, you know, maybe it'd lose a little bit of that magic. It totally held up. It totally held up. And even on the third and fourth, and, and I think maybe even a fifth viewing in there, um, it's it hasn't lost an ounce of of uh of intrigue, I guess is the perfect word for me. Every time I watch it, I watch it with an eyebrow raised. And might, yeah, it might literally be like the most intriguing movie, especially as you start like peeling it back and like the, for sure. the layers down. You're like, Absolutely. holy, you're like, it doesn't end. It's a, right. oh my God, it's like a Pandora's box. Like you, <laughs> right. Yeah, oh, no, yeah. So you, it's you, intentionally that way. you yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you sure. open it, you open it up and then it's just like inside of it. It's a, uh, it's a uh, Russian nesting doll. You open up the box, and there's another box in the box, and you open up it that just box. Keeps just keeps going. It a, just keeps on going. It's just, it's just boxes, and it's just, uh, yeah, it's just madness. Yeah, and for that, that being said, my rating, it's a ten out of ten. Boom, boom, you did it. That's two. That's a. That's our first ten out of ten film. It purely is that, and. Listen, I, I I challenge anyone to you know to like convince me that this is a bad film or that this film is lacking in some way. Like I just I've seen it enough times at this point that I just trust it and I just trust what it's doing. And for me, it's as close to a, a masterpiece in the 21st century as I've seen yet. It's up there with every all it's up there with There Will Be Blood. It's up there with No Country for Old Men. It kind of does a lot of the same things that those films do, which it takes on like it just takes masculinity into a, into this new place and it just challenges you and it challenges you to think about the film over and over and over again. And there's no better quality and then when the you, film brings to me. When you do to think, think about, about it over and when you do think about it over and over again, it, it rewards you at every step. Um, it really does. Going, going through like, dude, just go through Greek mythology and look through it. You're like, Oh my, there's parallels to like a bunch of stuff there to where there was, I had to do like a, like who does this most relate to where I'm changing stuff last second before we go <laughs> on. Like, I'm glad like we did it as like late as we did because like, I was like, all right, I think I like finally got it. Like right now everything's in. And then I changed Listen, and it. Even, I was walking and back even, to the store. And even if that's not like, even if that's the, not the direction that like most interests you, there's like three other way lenses to lenses to view the film through like right like you, you've got mythology you've got psychology you've got sexuality you've got masculinity there's just a million ways there's like i i shouldn't say a million there's like four or five genuine the paganism if, the religious the paganism, aspect the, right the the puritism like there's there's a lot there's multiple lenses you can watch the film so you could watch the film a different way or you can time. watch it as a legit just period piece Sure, and that's what oh, I yeah. did. The you first time, that's what film. I did. I was right, like, "They're just both crazy," and yeah, it works. Yeah. It it works perfectly as that. But oh is, yeah, because you know what it does? It, it actually does work that way. Because like I was thinking about, I was like, towards the end of the film, if you just cast, if you just like get through the bizarre scenes that are like kind of they seem inexplicable, like, they're both going crazy. It'll take care of you though. It'll it'll validate that thought. It'll it, the the dialogue validates your thinking about oh shit they they they're all they're not completely lost because I think they there's have, nothing there's a in grounding like, of of uh, of uh, uh, Winslow's character at one point where they interact towards the end like after mm -hmm. they've woken up from drinking the the um, the honey and um, honey turp yeah what is it what is it it's kerosene right no, honey it's not and kerosene. turpentine. 
turpentine. That's what it is. Um, and they wake up from that and then all of a sudden um, he stands up to him and like, he doesn't seem quite as insane, um, which changes obviously, but like, it's just what I mean. It's like this film is just has so much to offer. And I do think in about 10 or 15 years, um, people will look back and and they'll appreciate it in a different after way. after he drops Nosferatu and people start looking at the other films yeah. like Spurs, yeah if he blows it out of the water with Nosferatu or that thing is which let's be real do, do you just do you nail three out of three and just totally miss the mark on the fourth one Probably not likely he's only got more resources and more time to master the craft I I, I think you can trust him at this more point. trust man yeah exactly yeah. that's why that's exactly what I was gonna say more trust. Yeah. So, all right, we'll take one more short break. When we come back, um, we're going to talk about what's next on the Peripheral Views podcast. So thank you guys for listening. Our ratings were both a 10 out of 10 for The Lighthouse. Um, big scores for a unbelievable film. Um, hang tight. We'll be right back after this break. Great, uh, great. One of our better episodes, in my opinion. I, I had a blast with it. Well, at least for your enjoyment purposes. I mean, if, for listening pleasures, I don't know. But for in terms of discussion and talking about something, this is exactly like I said at the beginning of the podcast. This is why I wanted to start a podcast in the first place. In, in, I'm sorry, in the first place, and uh, why Arrow was the uh, perfect companion for that uh, for that adventure. So um, we've uh, we've Lighthouse is in the books. Night 2019's. Uh, Robert Eager's um, psychological thriller Lighthouse in the books. Two big 10 out of 10 ratings, our best film yet in terms of our ratings. Um, what do we got next, Daryl? Upcoming on the Peripheral Views podcast, our ninth episode is going to be the second installment in our music series. And uh, we're going to jump right into another one that's going to be a hell of a discussion. Um, Errol and I have been talking about Lupe Fiasco and his music for a very, very long time. We're talking 10 plus years. We've been talking this stuff together. So we decided we landed on a, a starting place to introduce him into the discussion uh, for the podcast. So what we're going to kick things off with with him, with him as an artist, and believe me, this will not be our last visitation. I, yeah, I was going to say very, very likely just the like literally that the start. Inter introduction is a very good word for yeah. it. Yeah, he's 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 going to be circling back, circled back to um, probably multiple times. Not probably, definitely multiple times because um, he's just got a catalog that uh, it's just there's going to be. This is going to be an undertaking too. I mean, if, for, talk about being scared. Like this is a this is an album. I'm going to just any of his work is going to be an undertaking to kind of piece apart. We're going to do the best damn job we can with that, um, and we're going to be talking Lupe Fiasco's "The Cool" by obviously Lupe Fiasco. Released in 2007. Um, unbelievable album. Can't wait to talk about that one. Eventually, we should talk about some shit we don't like. I mean, I don't know. I, we're, yeah, yeah. You know what? Yeah. No, that's you're actually working good working shit idea. we don't like. Well, I, what, I think the way to do that is um, my, my theory was when we do uh, content selections where you pick three and then I pick three and then we pick from each other's three. So that way... If you give me three shitty choices, we eventually have to do something that at least one of us doesn't like. Um, it eventually that will happen, but so far our interests are kind of like aligned pretty well on a lot of stuff. So it's going to be a while before we get something we don't like. But in the meantime, 
we'll just keep doing our deep dives on the stuff that we do like because uh, there's a lot to talk about out in the world in terms of our content. Um, beyond that episode, we really don't have anything in the book, so we're going to take a, uh, about a week or so to get that one together. It's also a massive undertaking because Lupe Fiasco's music is um, full of uh, the lyrics and the lyrical content is full I of am, double, triple, I... quadruple entendres. I am confident we could do an episode like just this long on the song failure. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, easily. I'm, I'm like, I'm not just this, not just that song. We could do it on a lot of his songs, just, just the songs, but yeah, no failure is a good example of one. Cause that was, that's, that one's just chock full as they say, but um, we'll start that's with mean. the cool. What? I said, it's mean soldier. Yeah. It's mean soldier. That's right. Um, so that, that's why we're going to kick it off. We're going to kick it off with The Cool um, by Lupe Fiasco. Super pumped. It's a concept album. There's going to be a lot to talk about there. Talking um, about so, the uh, the history of uh, Michael Young history. The, yeah, Michael Young. Michael, Michael Young history. Michael Young history. That's what we're, that's what we're diving into. That'll, be, uh, that'll probably be recorded. We're going to spend about a week or a week and a half trying to get that together. That'll probably get recorded sometime at the end of next week, if not uh, the following week. And in that meantime, Errol and I are going to do a little consulting and we're going to come up with uh, our next couple episodes. So by the time that one is recorded, we will have a few on deck. Might see, a, to... might see a fireside chat. Yeah, that's what we were discussing, potentially uh, whipping one of those together. We'll try to work, try to start that series, our fireside chat series. We haven't, I don't think we've discussed it on the podcast quite yet, but that's going to be a series in which Errol and I are going to just basically uh, sit down, hit the record button have a few topics in mind to just kind of bounce around and we're just going to let the conversation flow just like we would if we were sitting by the fire. Yeah. Um, uh, if you have any questions, that'd be a good time for us to answer them. So, Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. So like maybe we could do a poll and we could uh, pump them in there and that could kind of, that can help guide us. Um, I could do a poll on Twitter or, um, maybe we can announce it on the podcast. That might be an episode or two away, but at least by the time that we are ready to record and release the, the Lupe fiasco is the cool we will, um, in that recording, we will announce what's going to come next, whether it's Fireside Chat or um, other content. We're not sure yet. We're going to work on that and get that prepared for you. Um, Errol, you got any closing thoughts on The Lighthouse? Um, No, I honestly really don't. Yeah, oh, I, I thought we covered a lot of stuff. Covered a lot. And we said a lot and we had a lot to say about it. And I'm glad we did it. So um, that being said, uh, we appreciate all the support and any any of you listeners who are uh, sticking around with us. We really do appreciate your uh, your time and attention to the podcast. Uh, for new listeners, if you're looking to uh, check us out, we are on Twitter at peripheralv123. We are on soundcloud.com at forward slash peripheralviews123. Uh, for questions and inquiries, please reach out to us, peripheralviewspodcast at gmail.com. Um, Throw us in the search bar and your favorite streaming platforms, specifically Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, if you do, be sure to hit that notification bell and please subscribe. Also, leaving us a review and rating helps support podcasts on the airwaves. Um, and stay in touch with us along the way for any developments on our uh, website construction that's coming along the way. Um, be, be sure to stay tuned for that, uh, for any updates regarding that over the next handful of weeks. So, we're going to keep chipping away at that. We appreciate you guys listening. This was the Peripheral Views podcast and our third installment of the film series on Robert Eager's 2019 probably stone cold classic, The Lighthouse. Thank you guys for listening. Check us on the next round for the Peripheral Views podcast. Have a good night, folks. Thanks for hanging out. Peace.